Прийшли окупанти до нас в Україну, форма новенька, воєнні машини так трохи поплавився їх інвентар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Російські танкісти сховали з кущі, щоб лавтим посьорбати довбані щі, та трохи у чах перегрівся на бар. Байрактар. Великой страны Никто воды всякое озброение Ризные потужные ракеты Машины залезные у нас на все доводы Есть комментар Байрактар Вони захопити хотіли на зразу, а ми зачаїли на орків образу з російських бандитів. Робить примар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Російська поліція справи заводить, там пивцю рашистів ніяк не знаходить. Хто винен, що в нашому полі глухар? Байрактар. Байрактар Веде пропаганду кремлівський урод Слова пропаганди ковтає народ Тепер нове слово знає цар Байрактар 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 Хотите жить? Бегите. Хотите жить? Сдавайтесь в плен. Россия не получит новую территорию Украины. Россия присоединит себя к той катастрофе, которую она принесла на оккупированную территорию нашей страны. Оккупант заполняет могилами захваченную территорию Украины. И все больше могил на территории самой России. Ценой того, что один, один человек в России хочет продолжать эту войну, кто хочет 
войны больше, чем жизнь вашей жизни, граждане России. I'm the Enforcer, and I'm accompanied by Enforcer Matt. And good evening, folks. It's Enforcer Matt, and welcome back to Day 552 of the News. And it's good to see you all once again. And I have one question for you all. What Air Defense doing? What is the Air Defense doing today? Of course, we're going to be covering the past 20... Well, actually, yeah, it really is just the past 24 hours of the news of the war in Ukraine. Because so much has happened over just the past 24 hours. We have actually had to pretty much omit... Monday's news entirely. Um, just to put this out there, nothing that eventful happened on Monday, but today was a massive day. By no stretch of the imagination, the damage that Ukraine has inflicted onto the Russian Air Force today is the most severe that has ever been inflicted in a single day of the entire war. Today was the most devastating day that has ever been seen while I sit oh here goodness. and my throat is devastated by the spitball that just went right down the wrong esophagus. But... <laughs> Anyways, we are going to be getting right into the news tonight because it is absolutely unbelievable. We're going to be moving on up into the area of Skov first. Skov is a town inside of the Russian Federation that is almost on the border of Estonia. And I'll be taking you all there in Google Maps to give you all a little bit of a look at what Skov looks like. So here is Skov, the wonderful, beautiful town of Skov. Most of y'all have probably never even heard of this town, and I wouldn't blame you. It's a fairly small one uh, in the Russian Federation, but one thing that's fairly important about this town is the air base to the south of it. Some people, some Russian bots out there, are already insisting that the Ukrainians actually struck Ukrainian civil, well, actually Russian civilian airliners. The problem with that is that Skov doesn't have a civil airfield. It only has a military airbase. And it's this one right here, right inside the city. And if we take a look at it on satellite footage, we can see that when this satellite picture was taken, it appears to be housing an entire airlift wing um, of the Russian Air Force that consists entirely of Aleutian 76s, the largest and probably most capable um frontline transport aircraft that the Russians have. And when I say frontline, that's a little bit of a stretch. You'll never see these things flying over a frontline unless if it's the very beginning of the war and the Russians heavily over underestimated what the Ukrainians could do. Regardless, something interesting happened just a few hours ago, around four hours ago at this moment, and that was explosions were spotted from the Skov airfield. And so let me show you all real quick that video. We can see the guy looking over there, and oh, look, the sun's rising early. <laughs> so here, there goes the explosion. Good morning, Russia. <laughs> but anyways, great to see a little bit of an early sunrise in the area of Skov, and it had, it had a meaning behind it. We'll be moving on into the next clip here really quickly because we actually laid these out in sequence as to when each of them was happening. And so moving on into the next one, we then saw a video showing that the Spetsnaz headquarters, or the home of the GRU, or otherwise known as Gruul from the Minions, uh, was hit. 
Охренеть. We can see another drone. <laughs> We can see another drone hitting the Skov airfield and hitting the Gru headquarters, uh, which means that the VDV, the Spetsnaz, and any other unit that falls under the, uh, I guess you could say, the control of the GRU within the Russian army, they just lost their headquarters because they were actually headquartered out of Skov. Of course, car alarms going off. It's your usual fare. It's another day in Russia. And we hear a little bit of gunfire out there as the base's air defenses, which is just a couple of conscripts with AKs, uh, wi fire wildly into the sky, hoping that they'll hit something. Man, in Russia, you got to pay extra for this experience. Get the uh, like the wartime experience. That's an option. <laughs> Dude, they're sitting there going, "Oh man, the Western sanctions." They've stopped us from watching Oppenheimer bleed. And then they sit there and watch the Skov airfield turn into a fireball and then go, Oppenheimer <laughs> yes. is here? <laughs> it's, it's Putin said he wanted us to really feel it. So we really feel the heat. It burned my skin off. <laughs> Dude, it's kind of warm. It's kind of bright too. My corneas <laughs> are burning. But anyways, moving on from that, we've got to move on into the next clips because as sunlight began to kind of start to break around the Skov airfield, which would have happened just about two hours ago inside of Russia, the visible damage was seen. From what we've been told, four aircraft have been damaged at the Skov airfield, but one thing's for certain, two of them have been outright destroyed. The other two may be lightly damaged, but in this clip, we can clearly see the burning remains of two Russian aircraft that were stationed at this airbase. We can see the fuselage of one right there. It's silhouetted by the flames. <laughs> Now you see him rolling down the window, just to get a better view of it like he couldn't already. And from what we were told, there's also a second burning aircraft, and you can see some of the fires licking off of it over here. Apparently this little pool of flames, from what I've been trying to find out, is actually from the second aircraft that has also been hit and is also on fire. Unfortunately, due to the darkness of this video, and while we understand that the sun is supposed to be rising at this point, we couldn't really tell exactly where this was on the Skov airfield. Another important thing that y'all may notice is that the berms around some of these pads are non-existent. Other ones have some small berms put around them that are supposed to mitigate any damage that's caused from one uh, pad to the next, but some of them just don't have that. And there's an interesting thing to note there, because from what we saw, two aircraft were damaged. So if we can find two pads that are relatively close to each other, we'll probably have a pretty good basis to say that must be where these aircraft were hit. And out of everywhere that we're looking at right now, I would have to say it's probably this part of the airfield that was hit. If there is one pool of fire over here and another one off camera around here, that truck may have been sitting at this point on the ramp and it may have been washing the fire from that direction. We're not exactly sure. And I have to say that us trying to geolocate this to an exact spot on the airfield is completely guesswork because in these video footage, uh, well, in all the video footage, it was too dark to really tell exactly where it was on the airfield. There wasn't enough identifying landmarks, but from what we understand, it may be possible that two aircraft have been destroyed and both of those may be Aleutian 76s. Also, something else that I forgot to mention is that this airfield is also home to uh, some AN-2s, which are also transport aircraft used inside of the Russian Army, and, well, more so the Russian Air Force. But let me get y'all to an Antonov-2. And uh, this is what they are. They're used in the Russian Army, believe it or not. That's actually a normal transport plane for the smaller end of supplies. So, you know, if you ever... That's unbelievable, especially like an old-style biplane, but it has a modern twist to it. Yeah, that's like this thing is this thing is backwards as hell. And just to give you an idea of how old it is, this, the first time that this aircraft ever flew was in 1947, which means that this aircraft took its first flight the same year that the first AKs entered service in the in the Soviet Army. So it's a fairly old plane, a fairly well. Fairly is, is a bit of an understatement. It is ancient by aircraft standards, but it's also home to that air wing as well. It's less important, and who gives a crap about the Antonov 2s? They're incredibly cheap, very inexpensive. They even make them, from what I understand, to this day because they're so easy to make. So, you know, if any of those were hit or destroyed, there's no point in even making a big deal about that because they're largely replaceable. But Aleutian 76s, on the other hand, are not replaceable and may be causing a massive hindrance for the Russian Air Force in their duties of trying to fulfill supply needs of the war or even doing things inside of the Russian Federation. Uh, but of course, two aircraft 
destroyed to possibly damaged just in Skov alone. But the title says that all Russian airfields were attacked. And when I wrote down that title, I also have to say this real quick. That title sadly had to have a, rem a, a word removed. All Russian airfields attacked. It is not just a word. It's actually multiple words. But there's a word limit on YouTube titles, so we can't include it all. All Russian airfields attacked in the Western Theater. So you didn't see all the airfields of Vladivostok being attacked or anything Um largely getting close to uh, Chelyabinsk or Yekaterinburg, stuff like that was spared. It was all of the airfields that largely are within the Ukrainian field or the Ukrainian theater that were attacked today inside of Russia. And that brings us right on into our next thing beyond that video of the burning plane. Apparently, these aren't. The, this isn't the only attack that happened within the Russian Federation. Someone put out a really smart-looking infographic here. It's about on the level and quality that I would make, so i got to give a lot of credit. They did a good job here. And from what we know, three air bases have been attacked. The one at Skov, where we know that four aircraft have been damaged, two of them have been outright destroyed. One at Bryansk and one at Tula. To give you all a little bit of a, of a menu for tonight, we have videos from Bryansk of the attack on that airfield, we sadly don't have any videos of the attack at Tula, but it has been confirmed an attack has happened at Tula. It's just that we have no video or picture evidence to back up what kind of damage was caused or what that attack actually looked like. So sadly, I won't be able to show you all that one, but I will be able to show you all what Skov is looking like right now. This video was taken about an hour and 30 minutes ago, and it's showing a interesting scene at Skov. It looks like Yevgeny Prigozhin's new home. Hell! Look at that. Good lord. Damn. Damn, son. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to do it, but I didn't quite transition into the uh, the phrase quite right. And also, Matthew, notice this. Because we saw two aircraft burning side by side a moment ago. There are two very large pillars of smoke coming from that airfield in completely different areas of the, of the pad or the tarmac. And so, going off of that, that may be another several Aleutian 76s or a, a fuel depot that has been hit at the airfield and is also burning as well. We still don't know the exact extent of damage rather than two aircraft have been destroyed. We know that outright. We know that for sure because we saw the fuselages as burning chars in the middle of the darkness. But on this here, we don't know what the second pillar of smoke is coming from or what kind of damage has been caused because of that fire. And those illusions be getting real elusive all of a sudden. Man, they really do, Blit. <laughs> Man, those illusions be nothing more than a freaking illusion, Blit. <laughs> <laughs> or plane? I don't see it. Dude, that's what the Russian government will say once all the illusions are destroyed. They'll say, we never had illusions. That's a myth. <laughs> you know, we never even had jets like that. But we can see some stuff exploding over here in this pillar. A flame. We hear more explosions emanating from the field. This pillar is just going wild over here. We don't know what's on fire in that one. That may actually be a fuel depot or munitions due to how it's exploding. And I saw somebody say, what are they using? Is it missiles or drones? And it's drones, right? Yes, it is. From what we understand, all of these attacks were conducted by Ukraine with drones. And we also were able to once again get enough information to know that these drones apparently took off inside of Ukraine and flew all the way to their targets, completely undetected until they were on their final approach at these airfields. Uh, so we'll be going into that. We'll be going all into that in a minute because it's a big thing to note once more. Um, but yes, it is not missiles. It is Ukrainian drone attacks that are doing this. That's the heater, by the way. That's that's not your car alarm or anything. So if you heard the beep, it wasn't anything of yours. Uh, but we can see the fire continuing to rage. Really impressive to see how far uh, Ukraine is reaching with those drones. Now, I'm not really sure exactly how they're getting that type of range on it, unless they're launching from a point close by, which would kind of be a little bit weird. Well, I mean, you know, they are they have been going all out and researching and developing drone technology. This has been Ukraine's winning strategy of the war. So I would actually believe that they do have a drone that can travel this far. We'll measure the distance in a minute and see how far a drone would have had to have flied at its, at its minimum to get to Skov. But nevertheless, the damage that the Ukrainians are inflicting with these drones is on a scale that is completely unimaginable. The Russians in their best situations with their mass missile attacks have hardly been able to reap this kind of damage and this kind of effect onto Ukrainian armed forces, but the Ukrainians with 
their drones appear to be far more successful. But really quickly, before we move out of Skov and into Briansk, where the same thing happened again, I have to show y'all that apparently the Russians have freaked out at Skov, and they're calling in Operation Edelweiss. Edelweiss is a flower that grows in the Alpine mountain region. Usually the flower is uh, associated with uh, Alpine infantry or similar um, units of soldiers like that. Uh, usually it was heavily used in uh, the Austro-Hungarian military, the Swiss military, and also the German military um, because it usually signified that a mountaineer was well seasoned because to be able to even pick an Edelweiss flower, you have to climb a mountain about 8,000 feet tall to even find one. Um, because they grow at incredibly high altitudes. I don't know why the Russians called it in um, this thing, Operation Edelweiss. Uh, we've known about this for a while. The name doesn't really add up to anything, because these aren't mountain troops. They're, they have nothing to do with anything alpine. But apparently, Operation Edelweiss has been called in uh, in Skov, and we can see the Russian police coming out in mass, because apparently they're going to start um, committing some hardcore police brutality on these Ukrainian drones. <laughs> And here they come off the bus. They look like a, a group of kids at orientation. Just look at him go. This guy back here, he can't even be bothered to wear the helmet. <laughs> and also, I like how I like how it looks like he just got out of the yachting club with his little polo on. It's like, hey, dude, you don't look like a cop with a polo on. Yeah, I was about to say fresh out of the academy, but, you know, looking at them a little closer, I'm not really sure where these people came from. They, they look very diverse. <laughs> fresh out of the freaking Gopnik slum, <laughs> we, can see, we can see them Most all, likely. all hanging around. So, uh, what are the cops doing? Hell if I know, but apparently that's what Operation Edelweiss looks like. Doesn't look like an Edelweiss, doesn't have anything to do with Alpine operations, yet there they are. So it appears that the Russians are panicking. That's really all we can get from it. Moving on from Skov, however, and further south to Bryansk, things were also pretty heated. <laughs> get it? It, it, it? Things are about to be on fire. But anyways, things were also pretty heated in Bryansk as well. We got to hear some of the sounds of the attack, and we also got a really good look at the Bryansk air defenses in operation while the drones were coming in. So here's the video. This is <laughs> What an idiot. <laughs> what an idiot. Did you hear that, Matthew? This guy, like, I don't understand Russian well, but I know a few words. He says, is this motorcycle? He says, is this motorcycle? What an idiot. He's going to walk out of his door hearing something whirring in the sky and go, is that the flying motorcycle? <laughs> it's like, what? No. <laughs> This right now, Matthew, a Russian commissar is watching this video and listening to such a stupid question. He's going, Oh my god, we haven't had a soldier like this in the Russian army for 50 years. Quick, try this him. man. <laughs> Conscript him now. We hear the drone flying over. The camera's, of course, pointed into the pitch black <laughs> sky above. Or if he thinks that's a motorcycle, this dude has never heard a real motorcycle because that does not sound like one. Well, you know, it's it like Russia. a lawnmower. It is Russia. The best thing they have is trolley bus, bleed. Oh, there's the explosion. Oh. It's definitely not no motorcycle. Oh, they have house alarms in Russia? Dude, what the hell is this, SCP? Like, they got the <laughs> SCP alarm going off over here. Listen to that. <laughs> Protected by ABP. SCP-173, his breach containment. SCP-173, his breach containment. Keter class. Like, what the hell is that alarm? I think that's actually his house alarm. It sounds like a... Like a door alarm or something. Dude, they, they gave that whole alarm a soundtrack. Usually, like, it's a sound bit on a loop. Like, that one is, like, a three-minute soundtr soundtrack of, like, alarm jazz or something. Because it's, like, alternating the sound every few seconds to a different one. But anyways, there was a small video of one of the drones attacking Bryansk. Moving on into the next one. And let me make sure that we keep this all in the right order. Here's another video of the explosion. Yeah, yeah, we can see the explosion way off in the distance. And now we can hear the explosion. Success, Bliet. 
Uh, moving on into the next one, uh, we are going to be seeing another video. And this one appears to have actually been going towards the oil depot, um, which is also in Bryansk as well. But we also understand that the airfield was attacked. We'll be looking at Bryansk in a minute to kind of like figure this all out. You see him looking into the distance. Does that man have a golden Rolex? Dude, this Russian saved up for 10 years to get this thing, man. <laughs> like, he's like, golden. No. Then, <laughs> you dude, know he, that's a Bolex. Yeah, he got that freaking Bolex, boy. He's like, <laughs> look at who this guy, boy. <laughs> what is the time? Let me check my Bolex, boy. Oh. Oh. That explosion was realer than that Bolex. <laughs> <laughs> man, he's like, he's like. Get you that Bolex bling, Biet. That kind of bling that makes you go boom. <laughs> Damn. And so that's the end of that clip. Another view of one of the explosions occurring in Bryansk. And now here's the video of the subsequent fire that was caused by the damage from the drone. Do y'all hear that? That ah, snap that crackle and damage. Pop. That sounds like popcorn, but you know what that really is? That's ammunition, small arms ammo going up in a blaze. And oddly enough, this fire isn't at the oil depot or the airfield, so we actually don't have any video of the damage that was caused to the airfield, because we know that the hits were confirmed on the airfield, but it also appears that the Ukrainians attacked the oil depot from what we understand, because one of them was seen hitting the oil depot, and then another one that we didn't have a video of ended up hitting a ammunition storehouse somewhere else in Bryansk. So they hit three separate targets in the town of Bryansk from what we're understanding at the moment. And with that, that's the end of that clip. But y'all are starting to get the picture. Things went swimmingly today in Russia. Everything was attacked for the most part that was in the Ukrainian theater of operation. And from what we also heard in Kursk, we got to see some satellite pictures of the Kursk airfield. I don't know why these were published today. It seems like foreshadowing of some kind, but I'll show it to y'all real quick. Because the pictures were actually just unequivocally fire. I mean, like, I'm not even joking. Like, I would usually joke around about that. And you might not be able to see them well because it's just a mashup of all the pictures of the Kursk airfield. But we can see that it is almost completely empty. Do you notice that, Matthew? There's like maybe one, two, three. Let's see. Three aircraft on this entire airfield, according to the satellite pictures. That's it. It does look a little sparse, I have to admit. Man, it looks a little empty, Blit. But it may be foreshadowing, or it may be showing that the Russian Air Force is already evacuating a lot of their air wings out of the Ukrainian theater of operation and deeper inside of Russia to try and insulate it against Ukrainian drone attacks that the Russians, at the moment, have no defense to whatsoever. Considering that... Three attacks have occurred today, one at Tula, one at Bryansk, and one at Skov, and we have not really seen the Russians intercept or stop any of them, although we have no video footage from Tula. That is starting to give us a really good idea that the Russians have no defenses to any drone attacks, regardless of where they're going, whether it be Moscow, the airfields, army bases, there's nothing to stop the Ukrainian drones inside of Russia, showing that either the air defense is non-existent, which is probably the case, the air, exist, uh, the air defense probably is not there, it's in the front lines in Ukraine, because they had to pull together everything they can and also it's just it's just bizarre because a lot of people always sit there and talk about the almighty and invincible russian army interestingly enough i actually ran into someone in person that thought that uh at, at a certain place i won't say their name but it was very interesting to hear that and then you know you watch what really happens which is a ukrainian drone flying oh i don't know let's measure the range from here to up there. A uh, Ukrainian drone flying about 430 miles through Russian and Belarusian airspace, not getting shot down, and then hitting its target and destroying two Aleutian 76s. You see stuff like that, and then the story just doesn't add together. You would think that the Russians would have more air defense, but apparently, according to what we're seeing today, they don't. It's just completely devoid inside of the Russian Federation. And so if the Russians want to save their aircraft or stop Ukrainian attacks from reaching practically anywhere within Western Russia, they're going to have to start taking a massive amount of the air defenses left inside of Ukraine and redistribute them very loosely across Russia in hopes that they will be able to detect and intercept these drones before they make them to their targets. Moving on into the city of Voronezh, we can see that the Russians are still attempting to try and keep the war effort in Ukraine alive, although it is getting far more difficult now than it has been in the past. This apparently was in the Rosh Voronezh area, and we can see here... 
some BMDs. So this appears to be a convoy for a airborne unit, most likely. And also, another thing I'd like to note, you see that little orange and black stripe thing on the side of that APC, Matthew? That means that that BMD was used in the Victory Day Parade. So now they're taking... Really? Yes, yeah, so that means they're taking all of the beautiful APCs and tanks that they keep spotless for the Victory Day Parades yearly, and they're so low on these vehicles, they're having to take those and send them to Ukraine. And that's crazy, because I just saw yesterday that the British Intel said that Russia canceled their Zapod 2023 drill because they didn't have equipment, and apparently this is where it's all going. Yeah, apparently so, and we can see probably some of the last operational modern iterations of the T-72B3s on this train car here. And of course, when I say last, I'm sure there's probably several trains left of T-72B3s. But when you're talking about the Russians starting the war with around 600 to 700 T-72B3s, and they're now down to about maybe 150 to 200 of them, there's hardly any of them left. And these are a few examples that the Russians still have that they may be able to pull into the war. Although at this point, they're not going to have as much of an impact as they did at the start. Speaking of, speaking of the Russians trying to mobilize, the Russians are still trying to get more guys into the helicopter force or get more helicopters to the war. Because helicopters are a big deal if you're not crashing them and killing everyone in Chelyabinsk. We saw that a Russian MI-8 helicopter ran into some apparently technical difficulties, crashed, and then killed all three crew members on board. It pergosioned itself, but no one tried to shoot it down, so it's a little different. But when you see the Russians here uh, spraying a fire extinguisher onto the wreckage, yeah, that's literally just a fire extinguisher. That's kind of thick for a fire extinguisher. Man, that thing is—is is, is it really a fire extinguisher? Dude, that thing or is, is that throwing, a hosewood fire stuff coming out of it? Dude, that thing's throwing out packing peanuts, man. Like, I don't think that's a fire extinguisher. Like, what is that? And it's not really putting out the fire much either, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but let's see, dude. That honestly looks like a smoke machine more so than a than a fire extinguisher. I guess yeah, you can't... I don't even know. It's like shooting out like uh, suds and bubbles or something, hoping to put it out. <laughs> Man, we're going to be sucking today. <laughs> we're going to be sucking with the suds, please. It's like dancing with the stars, but Russian. And we can see him trying. You're saying it's foam. <laughs> I would hope so. Man, I'm hoping it's foam. Because if it's packing peanuts, they're in trouble, please. Um, But with that, that's the end of that clip. Unfortunate, so unfortunate to see they lost another MI8. Because the Russians are truly the best helicopter pilots on Earth. It's insane to think that something like that would happen. And the Russians, of course, are trying to play the strong man, although economically they're doing incredibly poorly. The ruble, apparently, and let me go check this real quick, because I heard rumors today about this, and I want to check this live on air with y'all. U.S. dollar to rubles. Oh, the ruble has actually rebounded just a little. So now one dollar is equivalent to ninety-five rubles instead of a hundred rubles. So it's just oh dang, the ruble's a real investment now. It's it's coming back strong. You know what, Matthew? That guy I was talking to is right. The Russian economy is so strong, it's going to defeat the U.S. economy, man. It's it's going man, to that guy's got you so salty, man. <laughs> he's dude, got he's, got, so me, he's salty. got me salty, man. Because like everything the guy said, it's like where the hell is that even coming from? But anyways, moving on from that. Great to see that the Russian economy is still doing poorly, because while it went from 100 rubles per dollar, and now it's just down to 95 rubles to a dollar, that's still a failing economy by most measures, especially considering what they started off the war with. But moving on into the area of Sochi, we heard that Erdogan is going to be meeting with President Putin in Sochi soon. I believe on September 4th, if I'm correct. And apparently, from what we know, the only thing that Erdogan is going to be talking about is the grain deal. Turkey was a huge benefactor of the grain deal. Uh, a lot of their grain comes from Ukraine. <laughs> that rhymes. And it's a big deal for them economically that they ensure that food security continues to exist through Ukrainian grain exports. There's also a lot of other countries that have a major stake in this, and these are more so aligned to the Russians than the Turks are. The Saudis are a major buyer of Ukrainian grain, considering that Saudi Arabia is a desert, it's pretty hard to grow anything there. And also, just in case anyone wants to say otherwise, there's the physical proof that you can't grow grain there. You see how it's like yellow all across the country? You can't grow grain in that. I, I promise you, I swear. I I'm, not I'm not an expert or anything. But I've heard it's pretty hard to grow grain up in that place. Uh, so they buy all of their grain from overseas. That's the only way they really can support their growing population. 
And so the fact that Ukrainian grain is no longer able to make it to them, they're having to buy the grain from elsewhere. The supply of that is a little less, and so the prices are going up. And so the Saudis would like to get Ukrainian grain back. And there's another country that will want it too, the Communist Chinese. They were actually one of the largest purchasers oh. of Ukrainian grain, and they, along with the Saudis, might be putting a little bit of pressure on the Russians in behind the scenes. It must not be an exorbitant amount. It must be pretty light for them to restart the grain deal so that way the Chinese and the Saudis can get back in on cheaper Ukrainian grains. You also have to remember that Ukrainian grain, since the war has begun, has hit very cheap prices. The Ukrainians are just trying to get stuff out of the country. And that actually ended up uh, causing countries like Poland and Germany to outlaw the importation and sell of Ukrainian grains because the prices were so low, it was destroying the agricultural industry of those countries because of the, the almost predatory pricing. And so now Ukrainian and you, grain... you heard that you heard the EU is trying to make them uh, accept the grain now, even in the face of all of that. Really? Yeah, they're trying to. The EU is trying to force Poland to accept the grain, and they're threatening to find them or something to that effect uh, to force them to take it at the low prices. I just, I just don't see that being productive. I don't see it being productive either, because in, in some of y'all are going to say, "What? Well, it is productive." It is for Ukraine, but if we end up destroying the the very successful economies in the Western world that allow us to be able to give the Ukrainians monetary support for their war, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot there. So I think that it's not smart to try and force Ukrainian grain onto Poland, especially if the Polish government saw that it was going to devastate their agricultural industry and, uh, and blow their kneecaps out for the next few decades. Uh, so I feel like that ought to be a Polish concern that the Polish fix for themselves and everyone allows them to make their own decision on that. Uh, but regardless, Ukrainian grain has to go somewhere. And it's either, and hopefully, due to Turkish actions, it might be going back into the rest of the world, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and China. But moving on from that news, which is great to hear, we're now going to be moving on into the Ukrainian frontline news itself. And there's actually been a large amount of it. And while the big news tonight was that Russian airfields were being attacked, it is massive everywhere. The Ukrainians have actually made some pretty steady advances in the area of Robotne, and from what we're seeing on Deep State UA, it appears that they're showing they may have overrun and taken the second Surovikin line in one area. Now, I'm not trying to hype y'all up or anything, but I would stick around and watch that because we're going to be looking at that and trying to compare the maps that we have of that area and see if that lines up and see if they have crossed the Surovikin line according to Deep State UA. But let's move into our location unknowns first, because we only have one of them beyond the casualty report, and it's a really cool video. And of course, before we get into that, we have to address what all of y'all have been saying in the live chat tonight. Y'all have been going insane. Um, like, it's it's currently been like 100 chats a minute, y'all been going wild, and we've run a poll to see what y'all have been thinking about some of the leading news of the night. And so with that, what do we got, Matthew? All right, and jumping right into that poll, the question is... Poland slash Baltic states are preparing for a quote-unquote critical incident and they declined to elaborate and what are your thoughts? It looks like 35% said uh, they are prepared for Wagner. 35% also said it's just a general precaution. 22% said they are prepared for terrorists and 9% said unsure. And uh, we did make this the topic of the short war summary the other day uh, and it's still kind of unclear what Poland means by a critical incident. I would assume they're talking about Wagner because at the, around the same time they demanded that Belarus expel Wagner from their country and obviously that's not going to happen because they're still there um, but I would say they're probably most likely prepared for Wagner uh, secondarily it could be they're preparing for terrorists or lone members of Wagner to try to cross the border and cause basically terrorist operations inside of Poland that's one possibility uh, also another thing is the Wagner and themselves it's unclear exactly how cohesive they are at the moment uh, it seems like they might be falling apart. There has been no attempt to go back to Moscow like they claimed. So I'm not even sure Wagner is going to be a real threat here in the next few weeks. But Enforcer, what say you? That's a very interesting point, Matthew. And that was a very good question on the poll. And some people might think it looks like they're getting ready for Wagner. But I hate to do this to everyone because I actually forgot to cover one bit of news that actually covers that directly inside of Russia. And that was the little bulletin in Moscow. And so to answer the poll, in my opinion... For the most part, I'm going to be taking us to this little bit of news that we got today from the Russian government. The Russian government came out today, Matthew, and they made an official statement about the Wagner. It's over, according to the Russians. And I'll read you the... Just like that. 
I'll it's read, over. I'll read you the direct quote from State Duma De uh, Deputy Viktor Sobolev. This is an illegal armed formation. There should not be any armed people in the state who are not subordinate to the state. As a result, it led to a rebellion. We were on the verge of a civil war. And so now he's saying that the Wagner unit is illegal and it will cease to exist, which also contradicts the other guy who came out literally just a day before and said the Wagner never even existed. Now this guy is saying they did exist. We were on the verge of a civil war. They rebelled. And now they're an illegal terrorist group for the most part. But according and to it also contradicts what Putin said, too, is he said they funded them. And that's the reason why they had to give their equipment back. Yeah, they, they contradict themselves with every single statement. Also, I like how this guy is standing in front of the banner of the Russian Communist Party, which is still a thing in Russia. It's like, where the hell is this picture taken, man? Yeah, really. It's like, uh, <laughs> well, I can't make that reference, but uh, it's 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 not good. Geschlick, my Leitman! Man, they always have that mad look on their face. They never look happy when they're standing in front of these uh, dictatorial type signs like this. They always have the finger pointing. Somebody's yelling, and it looks like something's going bad. Dude, it looks like he's going to be on Seinfeld and go. The stocks will go higher. <laughs> you know, it looks like he's about to do that. <laughs> if y'all don't know what I'm talking about, go pull that up. Uh, but anyways, what I have to say is based off of this news. The Polish are taking a general precaution, in my opinion. I'd have to go with the large majority of y'all that said that, because the Wagner is not going to exist beyond this point. We can already see that their camp has been dis uh, dismantled inside of Belarus, so they don't even have a basing point to work with anymore, and I think we're seeing the Wagner fade away. So now the Polish preparation is going to be in response to the Belarusians directly, and the Russians, instead of the Wagner unit by proxy, uh, acting on behalf of the Russians or the Belarusians. So that would be my honest opinion based off of that news that uh, Viktor Sobolev came out with today. And so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well, at least in my opinion. And we are on, I think, into the questions. And we are. We're moving on to our Super Chat questions. And up first, we have a very generous $50 donation from Troy Wilson. Hey! He's now a longtime channel viewer. And big thanks, Troy, for the big support and helping to keep us running. He says, I am proud to be Australian today. Uh, to see how effective our cardboard drones are making a huge impact. Now that's bang for your buck. Or should I say, that's not a knife. This is a knife. LOL. <laughs> hey, thank you for the support, Troy Wilson, and also being the largest supporter of the channel tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, and also, it is great to see that the Australian cardboard drones are doing good. Who in the world would have ever thought that one of the cheapest drones that have been given to Ukraine would be one of the most effective that they've had so far? Not me. I actually thought they would be one of the least effective, and they've turned out to be wildly successful inside of Ukraine. And it's showing that sometimes overcomplication of some systems isn't the best thing. Sometimes the simplicity that wins over the that area, especially considering that drone warfare in this form is in its infancy. Uh, and I would have to say they've done absolutely incredible. And a huge shout out to Australia as well, not just for the cardboard drones, but for everything else that the Australians have done. They are kind of a quiet and unsung supporter of Ukraine throughout most of this war. Not a lot of people focus on Australia, but Australia has done so much for Ukraine, all the way from their APCs to everything else. They all have helped out massively down there. And it's also a beautiful country filled with amazing people like you, Troy Wilson, and every other Australian viewer we have, because a lot of y'all are from Australia. Uh, and so with that, Thank you so much for the support. Thank you for coming in and representing Australia tonight in the Super Chats. And thank you so much for supporting this channel and helping us to keep it running. Because folks like you who support this channel, you help us to make this thing possible. Y'all made it possible for us to make it to another Sunday with y'all support through last week. And we were able to raise over $15,000 for Razum for Ukraine. And that continued support that y'all give in Super Chats helps us to do this as a full-time job and helps us to keep this thing running. And so thank you so much, Troy, for thinking about this channel and supporting us and also throwing in a good comment that points out how good Australia has been to Ukraine as far as their support and how ingenuitive Australian folks are coming up with amazing stuff like that. And so with that... I hope that does address that fairly well. And thank you so much once again, Troy Wilson, for being an old guard of this channel and helping us to keep this thing running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to none other than Duncan VR. Channel legend, by the way, as well, who puts in hey! a $75 donation. And thank you very much, Duncan, for the extremely generous support. And of course, it is now time for sound effects, animal noises, and the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, it says, Bamuba, quack, baba, no respect. Damn, for respect. Baba, dial 1-800-RESPECT. 
Six nine. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Baba. Math professor said, oh, man, I'm telling you. Baba. Quack, quack. Meow. It, uh, 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 that, that part looks sketchy for some reason. I don't know why. But moo, moo. Please hit more Russian <laughs> airbases. Snort, oink. But Kermit Froggy is a commie. Man, what the hell? Where the hell did that come uh, from? Kermit the Frog Ba-ba. is not a communist. Oh, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> uh, but anyways, I thank you so much for the support, Duncan VR. I'm saving Matthew from having to read off the last Baba's right there. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, spare him, No, please. I actually got him in. I got him in. Oh, you did? But where the hell did that Kermit part come from, though? Why do you take a shot at Kermit out know, of the blue man. like, like that? Like, well, like, we're always, we're always, well, dude, we smack Freddy uh, around on this channel from Scooby-Doo. That guy is a young pioneer, man. I feel like that's like just a, a known fact. At this point, he is certainly a young pioneer with his commie cronies running around in a hippie van. You know, it, it all makes sense. It all adds together. But Kermit the Frog being a communist? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, let me think of some things that might be in defense of him not being a communist. Uh, he lives in a swamp. You know, he could be Cajun. And not a lot of Cajuns are commies, you know. Um, and, and I don't know. I mean, like, you know, he is pretty weird sounding. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to do that voice again. But um, with that... I thank you so much for the massive amount of support, Duncan, and also throwing you in the animal noises. And I say that I say this almost the same thing every single time you throw them in, but I have to because, like your animal noises are a tradition, the response is nearly a tradition as well as this, at this point. And I got to thank you so much once again, Duncan, for throwing in something that we can get a good laugh out of. Because I got a good laugh out of a good bit of that. And thank you so much for helping this channel to keep on running. I mean, keeping, uh, keeping an eye out for us and helping us to keep this thing rolling. We only can run thanks to y'all's support. And if it wasn't for y'all continuously supporting and helping this channel to keep on running, this wouldn't be possible. And so thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that fairly well. And thank you, Duncan, for being an old guard and always being known as the Animal Noises Guy. And so with that, we are on to the last question of this segment. And then we're going to be moving on into our location unknowns and the frontline news as well. All right, and the last super chat of this segment goes to Duncan McIntosh, who puts in an extremely generous 100, I believe, Australian donation. Crocky. And also, that is Duncan's first super chat of the channel. And also, I believe he's new as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, Duncan, welcome to the LSA, and thank you very much for helping to fund our operation. And he says, another Duncan from OZ, and assuming Ukraine purchased drones, therefore, no limit to where used, question mark. And thank you so much for the massive amount of support, Duncan. That's your first time, according to YouTube, supporting. Uh, let us know if it's wrong, because sometimes it is wrong. Uh, and But I have to be honest. I don't think if we have seen your name, we've seen it often. So thank you so much for the massive support and helping the channel to keep on running. Oh, get the pod, Matthew. Get it. Get it. Axe it. Get it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it takes YouTube like five seconds to like catch up to it, but I've already hit them. Like the moment they pop up, uh, pop up in the chat, it takes YouTube more time to respond than I do. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it? It, it aggravates me so much. But anyways, getting back to Duncan's, uh, also really cool to hear that it's another Duncan from the land of Australia. We got a lot of Australians in here tonight and the Australians are repping the set. I mean, hell, I think they're like, I don't know. Let us know. But I think there are more Australians in here tonight from what we're seeing than anyone else. So let us know in the live chat where y'all are from. Um, because, you know, we're always interested in that. I always want to know where y'all are from, at least. Not trying to stalk y'all or anything. But anyways, uh, the Australians have done an incredible job. And I'm not just saying that because y'all are here. I'm saying that because it's true. The Australians are, have, are doing absolutely incredible on their end supporting Ukraine. And assuming, and let's just assume that they did purchase those drones from the Australians. Sadly, that doesn't actually give them any control over where they can use them. They can't use them everywhere because if they want to ensure that the Australians will give them drones again if they want to buy them, they have to use them the way the Australians want. Like, for example, here's a good example. Um, Germany, well, no, we won't go with Germany because they use Eurofighters. The Netherlands has F-16s, but notice that while they bought them and they legally own them and then the united states has no actual stake or holding in those f-16s you know at least uh monetarily the dutch still had to ask the united states to give them the green light to give their jets to ukraine because the thing is is that you it's not that you just own the plane and you can do whatever you want with it because of that there's a whole lot more going into it because the united states is the one producing the spare parts for your jet so it's kind of like 
getting on bad terms with the car dealership that you got your car from. And it's the only place that you can get your car repaired if something breaks down on it. You don't want to get on bad terms with them because you'll never be able to get your car repaired if it breaks down. And you also won't be able to buy a new car from them. You know, unless when we're just saying that there's only one car dealer out there. And that's, you know, for this analogy, the United States. So while you may technically have bought the vehicle or the weapon and you own it 100%, the country that sold it to you still gets a large stake in what you can and can't do with that weapon because otherwise they might not sell any weapons or spare parts to you again where you can keep your weapons running or keep on building up your military. So that weighs in a massive amount uh, on what countries can and can't do with their weaponry. And so while the Ukrainians, if we assume they've outright bought them, might be able to do whatever they want technically because they bought them, at the same time, the Australians might not want to sell it to them again if they use them the way the Australians told them not to. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address your question fairly well, Duncan. And that was a really good question. And thank you so much for the massive amount of support and helping the channel keep on running. Because folks like y'all who support the channel, whether it be big or small, $5 or $100 like you just threw in, Duncan, it helps us to keep this thing rolling. And it helps us to be able to do this. Uh, and I've got to thank each and every one of y'all so much once again for y'all's support and continuing to support the channel. Because it, it does help us to keep this thing rolling. I say that a lot. And I know like at this point it may just be like white noise to everyone. But I always take the time to thank each of y'all personally, whether it be a dollar, whether it be $500, because every single bit helps us to keep this channel running. And I greatly appreciate y'all's support. Y'all had y'all made the decision to support this channel. And not only that, y'all are spending y'all's hard-earned dollars. And I know how much it, it takes to make a dollar. You know, I used to work at normal jobs as well. And I know how much it takes. And I greatly appreciate that y'all that you folks find this channel so worthwhile. You would support us like that. And so we always want to make sure to thank each each and every single one of y'all for that reason. And so with that, thank you so much once again, Duncan. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, it's now time for us to move on out of the question segment and on into the location unknowns. We had a really cool video come out today of some MiG-29s, Ukrainian ones, in the skies. It says majestic footage. It's majestic, all right. Look at that. Man, I, I don't know what it is, but when you actually see, like, fighter jets in the sky, it just looks so surreal. Look, an old Soviet jet burning look, fuel. Look at that. That's the normal exhaust without the afterburner. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just <laughs> dumping. It's rolling coal. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the, uh, it's the lifted trucks of the sky. <laughs> Quick, get away. <laughs> Dude, your clothes will be soiled. Is that soiled. a shirtless redneck I see in the cockpit? Is that a kind of Copenhagen? <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of <laughs> dip. Um, but anyways, great to see the Ukrainian MiG-29s in flight. Beautiful video. Uh, of course, the MiG-29s are a little smoky. The engines run dirty when they're not on afterburner. But moving on from that, we also got the Russian casualty report for the day. And this thing was juice. And when I say juice, I'm not even kidding. Straight juice. And so, check it out. Eleven! Damn! Eleven Bobcats in a day? Am I seeing that right? Yeah, you're seeing it right. 11. It can't be. It can be. And it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Man, that really do be cray cray, though. That's crazy. 11. It was Bob at the Bobcat like, dealership or something today, because how do you hit 11 in a day? That's that's like almost a record, isn't it? I think it might be getting close. I think the highest number, though, was like 17 in a day. So it's on up there, though. It's way up there compared to the normal. Uh, but 11 right. Bobcats in a day, 11 special equipment vehicles. We actually have some of those being destroyed on film today. Uh, so we all will see what is being counted as a special equipment vehicle. But 11 of them were destroyed today, which is a huge hindrance for the Russians, especially with their defensive uh, in the south. But moving on from that, we also saw 530 Russian soldiers were liquidated, meaning that they were axed, whacked, gunned down, greased, they were, <laughs> whatever you want to call them. Over the past 24 hours, they had that happen to them. 17 armed personnel carriers were also destroyed, a considerable amount. Not only that, there is also 43 supply trucks that were destroyed. That is one of the highest numbers that we've seen in a single day and also i saw someone say that it's 43 fuel trucks sadly we don't actually know the breakdown it could be 43 fuel trucks but this is including every single supply truck out there so these could be scooby-doo vans they could be kamas you know Kamas. it could be urals could be zills whatever it is it is a supply truck but they could also be fuel trucks as well it's just that we don't know the exact uh demographics of what vehicles were what and how many of them were destroyed each but 
Moving on from that supply truck category, we also got to see 14 tanks destroyed in 24 hours. And that is an entire battalion tactical group of tanks wiped out, and then another four on top of that, which is almost another half of another battalion tactical group. This is straight juice. Like, not like juice the pilot. Like, you know, I think that's taking a whole different context now, but it's our way of saying juice. But anyways, 14 tanks destroyed. Absolutely incredible. Not only that, 25 artillery pieces were destroyed. Of course, the Ukrainian counter battery has been doing impressively today. Four drones were knocked out. Three MLRSs were also destroyed, along with four cruise missiles that were shot down and one anti-aircraft warfare system that was destroyed. Uh, we actually got to know which one that was. Sadly, I didn't include it in tonight's video, but it was destroyed in Crimea and it was one of three, and from what we understand, according to publicly listed numbers, that one vehicle costed the Russian government $200 million. $200 million? $200 million for one vehicle. It was, uh, and, and, and there's a reason behind it. It was souped up. It was one of the few vehicles in the entire Russian military that was souped up to the max. It was a radar installation um, vehicle that apparently had a radar that could stretch out for hundreds of miles in every direction. It was really one of the few that they had. It's one of three, and it got destroyed in Crimea today, so they lost about $200 million in one single ground vehicle. So, you and know... That's probably like a good chunk of Russia's whole net worth at this point. Yeah, <laughs> dude, they sit there, oh, man, that's like one-fifth of the GDP. <laughs> you know, they're like, this is pretty <laughs> bad. Uh, but anyways... Great I'm never going to financially recover from this. <laughs> Man, he said, dude, he's there said there, hi, this is the Russian army, and welcome to check it. <laughs> Blows up their $200 million radar system. But anyways, moving on from that and out of the casualty report, it's now time for us to move on up into the northeastern front. Some of y'all may have heard about this, but the Russians have been attempting a little offensive in this area, but over the past 48 hours, we haven't seen them move anywhere. The front lines have remained completely stagnant, meaning that Ukrainian defenders are holding them where they are. And we've been getting some videos out of the area showing what the battles have been looking like. And in our first one, we got to see that the Ukrainians have whipped out a T-84 Aplot in the northern area. This is attached to the 14th Mechanized Brigade of Prince Roman the Great. Uh, back at the beginning of the war, this unit was just known as the 14th Mechanized Brigade. It then was named the 14th Mechanized Brigade Prince Roman the Great, which actually sounds pretty hardcore, so I kind of respect the naming. But nevertheless, Less, pretty rare all plot and nice to see that they're whipping out some of the heavier weapons in some of the quieter parts of the front to put the russians down rightly moving on from that we also saw near Tokarivka that russian forces were destroyed rightly we're going to start using that a lot more i'm just kidding but anyways here's the clip when you see the epic intro from the 92nd when you hear the chat music already whirring up and now we can see the mist split poof and there goes the drone bomblet and when you see a fire has started on the SPG, they're now hitting the SPG right on top of the turret. And now the drone is panning. And we can see that the Mista S has already turned into an inferno with the drone bomblet piercing right through the top of the turret roof and setting off the ammunition stowage. We can now see I got a good idea. I got a good idea for Ukraine. Like, they ever want to come up with another fundraising idea? They could create, like, a little children's book. And they could call it Mr. S and Mr. B together again. <laughs> Okay, that was a good one. I didn't even see that, man. <laughs> man, that was good, B. <laughs> but anyways, you can see Hell another yeah. mist ass. They're dropping a bomblet on top of it. Oh man, dude, I'm actually I'm actually thinking about that. But I was like, that was a damn good one right there, man. Uh, but we see that Mr. S also had his ammo set alight. It's now burning. And I guess you could say the Russians are feeling the burn. Not political, not calm down, calm down. But anyways, moving on from that, we can see. A T-80. But you see that it says, Donk, T-80. <laughs> so there's the take. But you see the drone bomblet on its way down, hitting right on top of the turret. A second one hitting in front of the turret. The third one hitting to the rear of the turret. We haven't seen any of them puncture the hull or the turret yet. Uh, we can see them dropping some dead center onto the turret. And that one did puncture the turret. We can see some gases venting from the turret, showing that it has set something alight inside of it and is actually causing some real damage. We now see multiple bomblets hitting the engine bay. We can't really tell what kind of damage that's caused yet. And now we can see that they've moved on to a, a thing. I don't really know what this is. I couldn't really read it well enough. And now we can see that according to their cashier report, they were able to hit 
two Mista S's and knocked them out. They were able to damage, uh, I don't think they were able to destroy, but they were able to damage a T-80. And then down here, it says that this was um, a REV, a Sistema REV. So it's some, oh, it's an electronic warfare system. That's what it's saying. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. And then they were able to get a, generator uh that that actually right here oh, wow. Matthew, on this line says uh generatory um which is genera generator and i know i'm probably butchering the generator. Generator, uh and then we can see a bart bartisi uh snish uh techniki so it's a truck it's some kind of a truck <laughs> that's all i can get out of that it's a it's a freaking truck of some kind but it appears that the 92nd brigade was able to Conduct a flush. Uh, and so with that, we're now going to be moving on from that little clip and into our next one where we also saw another Mista S bite the dust in this area. It's not one of the ones that was in the previous video. It's completely separate. Take a look. Also, I'm going to be muting that. Also, look at this, Matthew. Dunk. And then the crew sits there and goes, whoop, 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 whoop. and then hops out of the turn and they go flying. They're like, get the hell out of here. And so they're gone. Man, Probably one gone. of the smartest things they've ever done in their life. Dude, they sat there and said, Skedder good, Bliat! Skedder good! <laughs> <laughs> and there they go, around the corner. Oh, dang. Just like uh, the Three Stooges used to do. <laughs> and now we can see the mist. Or Jabberjaw. <laughs> but anyways, we can see the mist. Oh! Oh! Well, no wonder dang, they were That's running. why they ran off. <laughs> Dude, they what was there. in that thing? Uh, ammo. <laughs> lots and lots of ammo. Jeez, man. That's actually, that That's was actually a pretty big explosion. <laughs> Jinx. But anyways, great to see another <laughs> Mr. S being destroyed. That means that just today, by video footage, we know that the Russians have lost three entire Mr. S SPGs. A fairly significant number. And once again, it hurts them where it counts the pocketbook. We're now going to be moving on from the northeastern front and further down the lines and into the area of Krimina. Because we saw in the area of Permina today that the Ukrainians have been hunting the Russians. Kind of like Elmer Fudd hunting rabbits, but he, uh, but uh, unlike Elmer Fudd, the Ukrainians ain't be goofing. They be out there for real. <laughs> so, here we can see a wandering Russian, and we can immediately see the M67 high explosive fragmentation grenade falling on its way down towards the unsuspecting fool. We can now see the grenade explode in front of him, and he stumbles over to the side, taking the stop, drop, and roll. Sadly, the video is on fire, but he is not. And we can see him laying there, probably thinking about the poor choices he's made in volunteering for the Russian army. We can now see the Ukrainian drone finding a group of Russians again. It appears that they're walking as a group. There goes the M67. Poof! And it explodes almost right on top of them. And it appears that it takes out... Uh... None of them. It scared the hell out of them. <laughs> so they dropped something too. We all I know what they dropped. We're not mentioning it. Oh, and here they are again. Oh, this is just zoomed in. Oh, Blit! Screw this guy! Let's get out of here! <laughs> and then they just start running off like little cartoon characters. It's like, what the hell? That's kind of jacked up, but that's the Russians. Uh, anyways, next bomblet hits. We don't even know what was down there. Oh, wait, there was a Russian in the bush. Push, push in the bush. But anyways, he's running off. And I was just about to say, one Russian in the bush is worth uh, two in the... Wait a minute, I think I got that backwards. One, <laughs> one, one Russian in the hand is worth two in the bush. Man, one Russian in the hand is worth two in bush, Blit. We now see another Russian. I said get all three. Have they ever considered that? Oh, they're about to. And there's number three. Oh my lord, that was, oh, that was right on. Yeah, I think they got the one in the hand and the two in the bush now, so I think they meant the rhyme. We now see them playing this one in slow-mo replay because the Ukrainians were so impressed with their work here, they had to show it twice. I mean, really, that was actually pretty crazy because the grenade has a about a three to five second fuse on it, and they somehow timed it just right to where the grenade landed, sat there for about a second or two, and then exploded once he was right beside it. So, you know, that was actually some really impressive calculating on the side of the Ukrainian drone pilots. We now see him taking a look, taking a little bit of a gander. 
And now we can see something blow up in a tree. Don't know what that was, but now we see a little Russian scurrying around below the tree. Something else exploded over here. And now, let's get it all. <laughs> they go running off. We now see what appears to be the two same guys running around here. But uh, now one of them's turning back and running back the other way. That's a mistake. Oh, wait, maybe not. Eh, maybe. You know that sound effect that they put in like cartoons, like on Scooby Doo, when they're like trying to run real fast and it goes like. You know, I wish I could find that sound. <laughs> like I was about to pull it up. But yeah, that's, that's my best rendition of it, but it didn't do it any justice. Man, I, I was wanting to pull that up so bad the whole time. You and me were thinking the same thing. Oh, now we can see the Russian trying to evade. And now we can see two other ones, it appears, and they're near an abandoned building. But the Ukrainian just whipped out a trick shot on that guy and probably just got him through the doorway. And now it looks like they're lining up the next one. And there it goes. I don't even know what the hell that was. It smoked when it dropped. Uh, but it's landing. Landed. A bomb. It explodes. Well, gee, thank you, man. <laughs> I'm talking about what variant it, <laughs> it is. It smoked when it exploded. Dude, those are like the stupid questions I sometimes ask in class because I don't know where the hell I am sometimes. So I'm like, um, quick question. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, yeah, that's the that's what it means in the case. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's, it's like, what kind of grenade was that? It's a bomb. Oh, thanks. Uh, you know, but anyways, we now see the Russians coming up to the tree and it appears that it's the giving tree because they've gotten presents. But they're nothing anyone wants. They're liabilities, at least in the Russians' minds. And so with that... Great to see that the Ukrainians are still using their drones to great effect in the Kremena direction, but no frontline advances to speak of there. Oddly enough, while we also saw a good amount of activity occurring in the Bakhmut region as well, it appears that according to Deep State U8, there have been no frontline successes by the Ukrainians in this direction over the past 48 hours. We have not seen any frontline movements whatsoever. We don't really know if that's accurate or not, considering that Deep State UA while saying it's updated for today, is usually about 48 hours behind for operational security reasons. The Ukrainians may have made ground, but we won't see that probably until the next day or the day after. Uh, so moving on to our first clip on the ridge near Yehidne, we got to see a little bit of a trench battle up there as they are continuing to fight down the ridge. This marker is not accurate, by the way. Um, Frontline battle markers... While they are in the general area where it happened, we always make sure that if they're showing a Ukrainian soldier, they are off by about at least two miles at this point. So this marker is not accurate to the location whatsoever. But some of y'all are probably wondering, why in the world is he fighting in this area? Well, he's not. He's fighting somewhere else, but we put the marker there. And so here's the clip. We see him lob a nade. And then my boy be slinging lead. Ooh. We hear the rounds flying right over him. He's now returning fire. He's reloading. Dude, the way this guy is aiming the rifle over the berm and just firing it, he's like, get! Yeah. <laughs> He's like, get out! Shut up! You know? And there was an artillery oh round coming God. in. And we see one land fairly close. He said Suga. We don't know if the guy's wounded right there or not, but that one landed pretty close. It appears to have sh shaken him up a little bit. But there is some of the video clips, some small very small clips put together showing what some of the fighting on the northern flank of Bakhmut is looking like. And while, and I always have to take a little bit of an aside to say this, while we always try and keep a positive tone on this channel, it is a war, and these guys are going through hell on earth. And this is just a small glimpse into their daily lives and the kind of stresses that they endure to continue fighting in this war. And their, their struggle that we just see on small glimpses and clips is massive inspiration to me that regardless of how difficult it's getting for us on our end to keep on covering this news. Because there are folks out there that are going through a whole lot worse than us. Of course, you know, they don't have the luxury of sitting inside of a house with air conditioning being able to do this. And it's absolutely amazing to see... Uh, what kind of stresses and what kind of dangers they go under, and yet they still have the morale and the determination to stay on the front lines with unwavering commitment and even to laugh and joke during the middle of all of it. It's absolutely incredible to see, and this is uh, just a small glimpse at one Ukrainian soldier's life on the front. But moving on from that clip and on down into the southern flank, we also got to see in the Klishkivka area that apparently, according to Hanna Mylar, the Russians are now trapped inside of Bakhmut. 
Some people today, because I actually made a video with this as the title today, like to say that this is clickbait. And really quickly, I have to address why the title says that. When a Ukrainian government official says something, and we have no reason at the moment to not believe what they say, we report it at face value. Like, for example, when the Ukrainian uh, intelligence chief Budinov was saying that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was going to blow up any day now, we reported it exactly as it comes out. And considering that the, um, the Deputy Defense Minister, Hanna Mylar, said that the Russians were surrounded in Bakhmut today, we reported exactly as it stated. Uh, we don't do any fibbing of the words, and then it's uh, really up to folks whether they want to think the Russians are encircled or not. Technically, they aren't. Uh, the Ukrainians have not made it behind Bakhmut and to the area of Pokrovsk, which would be directly east, but at the same time, they somewhat are encircled in one way, in which the Ukrainians control the major heights looking down onto Bakhmut, meaning that if Russian forces want to enter or leave the town, they are going to be coming under heavy fire and they're going to be taking massive casualties. And so, for intensive purposes, the Russian forces that are inside of Bakhmut right now are in fact encircled completely because if they attempt to leave, it will almost be like them trying to conduct a breakout in the middle of a siege. It'll result in high casualties and it most likely may end unsuccessfully. Um, but I have to also make that clear. But moving on into what Hanna Mylar said today, she said that the AFU in Bakhmut all, uh, area has already reached many dominant heights, meaning the heights around the Klishkivka area and also the heights near Yehidne, and they have trapped the Russians there because of that. They can't get out of Bakhmut, and they can't move fully around the city itself either, Mylar said. According to her, Ukrainian forces continue to slowly advance south of Bakhmut, having successes there. And it's gotten a little bit slower, to be honest with you all, over about the past week. Uh, so, you know, I have to keep that in mind, but I believe that may be because of some difficulties. We're still seeing them taking prisoners and clearing trenches in that area, so I don't know if the frontline map is just being slow to update, or if those uh, trenches being captured are parts of smaller affairs, and it's not really culminating in ground being taken that's large enough to account for, um, but that's our current situation in the southern flank. Moving on from that, um, the Deputy Defense Minister stressed that fierce fighting continued near the settlements of Klishkivka, Kurdomivka, and Andreevka, which are all of the major settlements that are currently on the front line in the southern front. From what we understand, the Ukrainians control half of Kurdomivka, all of Klishkivka, and all of Andreevka, but Russian forces are still attempting to fight into those villages, considering that they are directly across the railroad berm, which in some cases is literally on the village or directly adjacent to it, like in Klishkivka. But moving on from that, we're now going to be moving on into the clips in this area, specifically the one near Andreevka, where we saw that even more Russian forces in this area were surrendering. I mean, you see this Russian right here. He's going, I give up. And the Ukrainians are going, good. And so he's going, it's nice to lay in the grass. And the Ukrainians are going, yeah, it is. And then this guy's going, I would like to go home. And then the Ukrainians go, nah, <laughs> nah, you ain't going home. You go into a POW camp for now. So now he's getting up. You see the Ukrainians giving him commands, and now the Russian is on his way. But another Russian prisoner taken, nevertheless. Moving on from that clip and on into our next one, we also got to see that the 3rd Brigade was moving forward in mass around the canal zone today with a large amount of armor supporting them. We're going to have to mute that for copyright reasons, but we can see the Ukrainian tanks advancing forward. It appears that the 3rd Brigade is using, using what we would have seen at the beginning of the war, T-72Bs. We can see them firing as they advance on the tree line in front of them. And we can also see this T-72 firing off its smoke grenades, which is very rare. We rarely ever see that. And we can see that these tanks are pummeling everything around them. We can also see the canal right over here to the right side of the screen, showing us that they are in the area of the canal zone. We now see the tanks continuing to fire and now backing up a little bit, and now once again rolling forward. We can now see an internal view of the tank, and I also like that they gave a little shout out to Psyops up there in the corner. They got a little Psyops face up there. I sure do. <laughs> they do! They do it! But anyways... We now see the tank going through its auto-loading, and now you see the gun restabilizing and firing immediately. We 
We now see the tanks continuing to roll forward, running through some brush. And we now see a view inside the tank again of the autoloader reloading the gun. And then the tankers firing the gun right here. Post And there goes the shot. And now they're charging up <laughs> to the Russians going, Oh, bleh! They're not supposed to do that! And now we can see the commander has even gotten up on the turret. He's firing off the NSV up there right at him. Like, they're getting pretty ballsy with this one. We see them blasting him away very effectively. Continuing to fire, continuing to also shoot the machine gun as well. This this little attack right here didn't culminate in any ground being taken, but it did culminate probably in Russian forces being lost. But we don't know how many, and we don't know how effective it was. But it certainly was a little bit of a shock and all, a shock and all, or shock and all, like the tool on a very small scale. We now see the tank using its engine smoke generator, and we can also see a Russian running around up there. Did you see that, Matthew? The Russian saw the tank. Wait, let's see. Watch right up here where the mouse cursor is. He's like, oh, he's putting out smoke. It's my chance. <laughs> and then he goes running around really quickly. <laughs> and so now the tank's reversing out of the area, still discharging the smoke from the engine. And now we can see artillery coming in. I believe this is Ukrainian artillery hitting the area. Or it may be Russian artillery, it seems, because it's landing right around the Ukrainian tanks. We now see the tanks looking around a little bit more. And now the tanks are doing something that I would say is very dangerous, which is moving through a tree line. The Russians could be anywhere in this tree line. You know, of course, the Ukrainians may know better. They may know that this part of the tree line is clear. But if there was a Russian in this area with an RPG-7, this could pose a lot of issues for this T-72. But apparently there wasn't, as they did make it through the tree line perfectly fine. And now we can see the tanks making their way out as a massive artillery barrage fills the area. And we can also see the tank got a whole tree stuck to the front of it. But that's the end of the clip, and great to see the 3rd Brigade still fighting on and making sure to take out as many Russian forces as they can. Meanwhile, we also got to see that a rare SAM radar system for the Buick M3, which is called the 9S36M, was destroyed today. This is not the $200 million radar system. I believe this one was equivalent to about $50 million, but it was also destroyed today as well. Chad music ensues. Radar dead <laughs> that's, that's a bit, no better way to put it we see one russian walking away here he's probably about to start trying to guide it out and we can now see the radar system slowly moving on its way moving into a tree line to try and hide itself but it's a massive surfing board it's very hard to hide something that looks like that and so here comes the shell hitting right on top of the radar system and knocking out another 50 million dollar vehicle we can now see it burning on out to make sure that it's completely destroyed and thus the ukrainians are happy Moving on from the Bakhmut area altogether and on down into the southern front, we didn't get anything from Donetsk today. We also saw some really interesting stuff at Velika Novosilka. Ground has been made. And I'll be moving on down there real quick. And it's not massive amounts of ground. I mean, it's just a little bit over here to the flank. It's not like it's going to be important in the future or anything or help the Ukrainians to outflank the Russians. And I'm being sarcastic about that. It completely will. Uh, but the Russians are losing ground on the western flank of this battlefield. But it's not a massive amount. Um, well, it's not big enough yet to say that the Russians' western flank is now being threatened inside of a Bajania or Starlmanivka. Right now, it just appears to be a developing situation and hopefully one the Ukrainians can exploit. Moving on to our first clip, we did get to see that Russian prisoners of war were taken in some fighting that occurred within the village of Zaitabajania today. Uh, Eero Trapryx, uh, Trapryx, raw, raw, raggy, but anyways, we can see the Ukrainians taking prisoners. I mean, like, these Ukrainians are going around like police. They're just taking mass arrests. Pretty nice stuff, and they did it with Humvees only and some infantry. Not bad.
And also, congratulations, Gadzooks. Uh, I just saw that. Congratulations on getting engaged. Really cool. Hey, and, Gadzooks, oh, Gad, Gadzooks, he got engaged. <laughs> but anyways, moving on from that into the rear line around Star Manipka and Zaydeva Bajanya, uh, we also got to see that Russian tank lost his existence today. Y'all want to see that? I bet you yes. do. Dude, that's Pink Panther meets rap. You know, like that's what it sounded like. But when you see the tank moving around, when you see it coming up behind another destroyed tank, nothing ever goes wrong when that happens. And look at that. It's gone. And with that, that's the end of that little clip there. But beautiful to see that another tank has lost its existence. Moving on from that into our next clip, we also got to see that the defenses were delayed. For specific reasons. These are what are called Bobcat skid steers on the casualty report. When you all see the special equipment and it says a Bobcat and we say that 11 Bobcat skid steers are destroyed... Obviously, we don't mean 11 Bobcat skid steers have been destroyed. It pains me to know that there are some people out there who apparently are so dense they do take the phrase literally, but there are more special equipment vehicles than just Bobcats, and this is actually a good amount of the ones that you would see while we hear that very copyrighted little diddly. Uh, but here we can see a crane and also some other kind of a construction vehicle, but both of them are considered special equipment vehicles. Well, you see the, dr the drone getting a very good look at him, and then running into one. I, could, I guess you could say that was the best look that one could get. And we now see the damage caused to that truck. We can see that it appears that the front end's been blown out. Sadly, the back end wasn't blown out. We would be able to tell because there would be a Taco Bell burrito sitting somewhere around it. But anyways, Ooh. that's the end of that clip. And great to see that the Kamikaze drones were able to take care of one of those special equipment vehicles today. Moving on out of that area and further on over into the direction of Huilapul, we also got to see some random Russian equipment being destroyed in this general area. Chat music ensues. I'm not even going to try and describe what we're seeing because it's flipping around so quickly. It's really hard to even say what we're seeing. But we can see everything coming in. I mean everything. Look at this. They're running out of the BMP and the drone gets them anyways. And look at this. They're flying into a tree line and they get the D-20. While the Ukrainians may have gotten the D-20, I guess you could say it was the Russians themselves that actually got the D. Oh, <laughs> we can see them running into some more infantry squads and some tanks, and we can also see them hitting a BTR. We see them hitting the front of the BTR as well, and we see them uh, hitting the back of the BTR. We now see them, uh, you know, getting in the front, and now we see the BTR is on fire. Land now, damn it. Land now. <laughs> Dude, the drone is so anxious to knock out a Russian tank, it's demanding that they land the thing on a tank. <laughs> oh, dude, did you see how fast that one went? We'll see. <laughs> dude, that thing was going like Dang. 10 miles an hour, and then it just went to like 500 miles an hour. Look at that. It's just... <laughs> and then it just hits right on to It's like, good lord. Now you see a lot of getting hit. We can see a DHL delivery van getting hit. We can see a BTR getting hit. We can see a bunker getting hit. Oh, they're actually having a little town hall in there too. <laughs> and there it goes. And we can see another one getting hit. And, you know, another one. And, of course, another one. That's a BMP, actually. And, of course, another one. And another one. Man, I'm sounding like DJ Khaled around here. Another one. Another one. <laughs> another one. We and another the one. Best. I've got to tell you, it's Real absolutely life. incredible. It's absolutely great. We'd love to see it. I'd love to see lots of Russian vehicles getting destroyed. But i got to tell you. We're eating well. The best thing to see destroy. What the hell does that mean? I don't know what that means. Well, <laughs> you haven't seen DJ Khaled. <laughs> Man, DJ Khaled, he's eating a little too well. Gotta lay off the hamburgers, get a couple of salads. 
Just saying. Did you ever see that clip where Larry King asked him, uh, roasted him, and said, "And how'd you gain all the weight?" <laughs> he, really? He, like he actually asked him that for real. Dude, that's a man. <laughs> that's rest, a, rest in peace, Larry King. Rest his soul. I think that's what's legally called fighting words, right there. Like I think. Could that, be. And now we can see the last one in the clip, but great to see that they were able to knock out a load of Russian vehicles in that area of the line. Of course, largely a montage. But moving on down into the area of Robotne, we have seen that Ukrainian forces were able to continue advances here as well. Over the past 48 hours, it does appear that Ukrainian forces have been able to make some pretty decent gains. And this is the one we're largely considering may be serious. Well, I started my way through that. This is why. So let me go to the flanking maneuver here where a few days ago we saw that the Ukrainian forces had made it pretty far down there. They were right here, parallel to Nova Propivka. And so if we go back to that map, and this is no man's land, but now they are almost parallel with uh, Ilchinkove. So if we look at that, almost parallel with Ilchinkove. They have, in fact, actually reached the Suravikin line based off of that measurement and this map. They are on the Suravikin line right now in that area of the front line. And they may be breaking through that second line of defense. We'll have to wait and see for tomorrow. That'll probably be the breaking news tomorrow if it does happen. But right now, we are going to see how well the Suravikin line really will hold up now that Ukrainian forces have made it there in mass. We'll see how the Russians do. But moving on into the video clips and our first one, we got to see that the Ukrainians were able to capture a Russian BMP-3 intact from the battlefield today. I sadly won't be able to play the audio because it's copyrighted, but we can see the Ukrainians proud of their new possession and showing it off back there. Look at that. It's a BMP-3. Look, an old Soviet BMP. And now we can see them taking the Ukrainian flag and putting it atop the BMP. Look and they're it. editing this like a rap video or something. Man. <laughs> sort of fried freak. Seven days a week. <laughs> That's what I'm funny to you. <laughs> the hell? Man, we ain't reading the rest of that one. But uh, we can see the BMP on its way through the front. Wonderful to see. Great to see that you're able to capture a, an incredibly rare Russian APC. Moving on from that, we're going to be moving on to our next clip. Where we also saw more Russian forces surrendering in this area of the line as well today. We can see him sifting through his personal belongings here. And that's the end of the clip, but another Russian prisoner taken today. Moving on towards the area of Novoprovka, we also got to see a Ukrainian assault on a Russian trench. All right, we're going to be muting that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My ears sat there and started bleeding, and then I heard, hello, and I went, eh, hey, I'm good. <laughs> but we can see... I heard the, the music and had the sudden urge to surrender, Bliat. But we see the Ukrainians moving into the trench, and what do we see moving out of the trench? Well, not the Russians yet, but you will in a second. We can see the uh, trench getting hammered by some kind of high explosive, some kind of bombs. And now... There's the Russians. <laughs> That's it. Call these guys two men in a truck. Uh, because while it's not two guys and a truck, they are certainly moving. And we can see them taking off. <laughs> uh, everyone outside of the South doesn't even know what two men in a truck is. It's a moving company. Um, so hopefully the joke stands up pretty well to foreign audiences. But we can see them taking off. While the Ukrainians are back there clearing the trench very methodically because they think the Russians are probably still in there. The Russians are long gone at this point. And with that, that's the end of that clip. But man, their morale is rock bottom. When you start running like that, your whole entire platoon just gets up and runs. It, your your morale's poor, um, to say the least. But moving on into the next clip, we also got to see that according to the Institute for the Study of War, the 76th Brigade, which is a part of the VDV, or the 76th Division, has been moved into the area of Robotne to try and stop the Ukrainian advance. This is showing us that it's in they are in terrible states in that part of the line. But if you want to hear more about that in great detail, make sure to go check out today's video. Uh, you can find it on the channel page if you're subscribed, or even if you're not subscribed. And I went into very great detail on what that means for the Russian army and their position in Robotne as of today. Uh, so with that, we're going to be moving on from that little bit of news and on into our next one, where we also saw Russian forces in Novopropivka being hit pretty heavily. 
Antonio Fagundes. All right, uh, some some interesting romantic music plays as cluster munitions rain down from the sky on these Russian uh, forces. We see the cluster munitions all over, and uh, we can see through the clips, through the heavily edited clips, the Russians are now moving in a conga line again into the tree line, and there goes the cluster munitions again, and then a high explosive in the tree line. But we couldn't really tell how much damage that actually caused. But still great to see that the Ukrainians are using cluster munitions. We're now going to be moving on from this area of the front line where we do see the Ukrainians making a decent amount of progress. And we're going to be moving on down into the area of Harrison really quickly because we got to see that the Ukrainians were able to raise the flag over Dachi today. Uh, I have to make a quick correction on this because this is something that was actually misquoted earlier. We said that this flag was raised over Kazachi Lahiri. It was actually raised over Dachi. We found that out after the video was made. But moving on from that, we got to see that the Ukrainians made a firm foothold firm enough that they're going to wave their flag over it now i'm going to skip forward to the end because most of it's just him clipping the flag to the pole and also let me skip forward a little bit more here we go and we can hear him playing the best version of the ukrainian anthem we also play it on this channel and squeak 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 there it goes up to the top of the flagpole and the ukrainians now largely control the southern side of the dnieper river at least through the marshes Also, I don't know what the little emoji thing was all about, because this guy treated this thing like it was a war prize. I don't know what's up with it. But there's a little plushie. Pretty nice. Looks good. And then we can see the Ukrainian flag flying high up there. Of course, reminding everyone that the Russians suck nuts. Um, I didn't mean to put it out that way. <laughs> <The> <laughs> I didn't mean right. to say it that violently, but hey, you know, y'all get the picture. We try and keep it PG on here, but I don't think that was PG. <laughs> I seriously didn't mean to say it like that. Nuts. Nuts. <laughs> so that, that's the end of that clip. Wonderful to see. And we're now going to be moving on a little bit behind the lines, where we also saw what the Russians are looking like right now on this side of the left bank. This video was actually taken in the area. Apparently, these are Russians uh, at a camp. We don't even know if this camp is on an active front line in that area or if it's in the rear line. But this is what a normal life at a Russian camp looks like right now. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're very intelligent, to say the least. You see how they're making a bong out of the freaking Red Bull can and a lighter? This is Russian culture. The wicked wayward ways of the West attempt to destroy the Russian culture every single day, including this cheap form of a crack pipe. But nevertheless, the brave... That's about the only thing they can be ingenious on, is how to, like, uh, intoxicate themselves. The brave, strong Russians, Matthew. They are so genius and smart. This Western world cannot destroy them with their wicked, wayward ways. And they are going to sit there and have the bong. And I don't know why I'm turning into a German doing this, but anyways. Well, I think you. Man, shizzle. <laughs> man, if you hit that Red Bull can, though, I mean, I'm telling you. Oh, man, I'm telling you. Next thing you know, these guys are going to be uh, snorting uh, like Smarties off some desk somewhere. You know, they're going to do that next. <laughs> Look at him, that he's fine like... Siberian blow. Man. Like, just like his shirt says, this man's mental IQ is underground. I can't tell if he's looking at the camera or if he's looking to the guy off to the right. <laughs> I know he looks <laughs> vaguely familiar to me for some reason. I'm not gonna lie, he kinda does, doesn't he? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm gonna... Reminds me of some folks in Minnesota. Oh no! <laughs> Oh look, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gopnik himself is even partaking in the chuff. Next on the cultural menu is crocodile. They'll be taking that at three. Uh, 
Пошли не все. А чё? А я, мама, знаешь, что сделал? Что ты мне нахуй, блядь, снимаешь? Что нахуй, блядь, снимаешь? And then they immediately start to threaten violence at the end of the video for fun. I cannot stand that striped sailor shirt that these Russians wear. Did you see him wearing that? Yes, I did. What it, the hell is that shirt? Like, it, what is like so symbolic about it? Why do they all wear that junk? It looks like Popeye the Sailor Man shirt. Dude, this this thing right here makes you say, "I'm strong till the finish because I eat me spinach." <laughs> dude, that's that. That's Man, that. Man, where's um uh, um uh, olive, olive oil? Uh, what's the olive, yeah, olive oil? oil. <laughs> dude, this is that olive oil drip. <laughs> this is this is that. This just said you gotta be a sailor at 10 but you gotta beat up the fat bastard at the dock at nine <laughs> like you know and it doesn't even make sense timeline wise because you're beating his ass an hour earlier but you know in the popeye world it works <laughs> but yeah that little that little i forgot what the shirt's called it has a specific name it's like a Zimni or something like that. I don't know. But it's a stupid Maybe shirt. Maybe Popeye was Russian because he wore the same shirt and he's also got like the same look of these guys. Hold up, hold up. We gotta we gotta fact check this, Matthew. Popeye. I'm not gonna get copyrighted for this, am I? I don't think I am. Alright. Wait, hold up, hold up, 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 up. And we gotta fact check, fact check here. Popeye doesn't wear that shirt. He wears like a black shirt. Wait a minute, is 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 Popeye a fascist supporting Benito Mussolini? This man's a black shirt. <laughs> what the hell? Dude, I never noticed <laughs> Wait a that. minute. I think it might have been maybe Bluto or somebody that might have wore the shirt. I know there's a picture of Bluto right there. He's wearing a black shirt. Popeye, Popeye oh. did it, man. Oh, man, I think we're back. Arg. Oh, man. Popeye, oh. he's got a, a little bit of problems in his arms. All of his, uh, <laughs> all of his uh, muscle went to his uh, forearm instead of his top forearm. <laughs> Whoa, hey, whoa, hey, it seems like I got some cancer here. My arms are growing really big. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, dear, tumor. <laughs> oh, no, a tumor. <laughs> he was, dude. And what's up with Bluto, man? That that head is not in proportion with that body. It doesn't take an expert to know that. It's like dude. a thumb. Dude, Bl <laughs> dude, 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 Bluto, Bluto's pose right here is the pose when the Russians say, hey, who wants to join the army and get paid nothing? This is what one Russian guy does in the crowd. Oh, me. <laughs> it's I'll do it. It's, 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 oh, man, I'm telling you, I think we'll need a specialist for this one. Oh, man. But, dude. This is, dude, this is what the Russian conscript thinks of himself to look like. This is what he really looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Bluto or Bruto or whatever his name is, is like dried out in this photo. <laughs> dude, he fell on some rough times in that picture, man. He's having a tough time of it. Oh my God. <laughs> Man, dude. Oh my god, dude, I want to scroll down and look at this stuff on screen, but I'm scared, man, because it could be a romantic. What the hell is that one doing right there in the middle? The <laughs> dude, this one's sitting here and saying, Kiss me, fat boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What the hell? Dude, why are his legs so oh, thin? Dear. <laughs> dude, this guy's got Man, that. he skipped leg day. He went. <laughs> oh, my god. oh my lord. Dude. <laughs> It's always these rabbit holes that always end up being the funniest. Oh, man. Oh, dude, one second. Let me take this back off screen. I'll, I'll see if there's anything else to laugh at. I don't see him wearing the shirt, though. I don't know why in the world we're always saying Popeye's wearing that shirt. Because he's... I've seen him wear it in some episode. What? Oh, dude, I can't even find it, man. He's either wearing a black shirt or a white shirt. Yo, dude, no. <laughs> no. Dude, this episode of Bluto giving what off the them, them Weinstein vibes, man. Like, that's no that's no Bluto. That's freaking Weinstein in disguise. He's sitting there going, Man, that, guy, that, guy's, that guy's head is so small. He's going to need glasses <laughs> just to see it like, right in front of him. Dude. And what is olive oil trying to do? Striking a pose? What's going on here? Why, why's Popeye looking like that? Dude, Popeye looking like he enjoying that a little too much. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, really? It's, it's, like, so I need to keep an eye on him, but... Oh my god. And what's that sticking out of his legs, man? Like, do you see that? <laughs> what is that? Dude, he, he was crucified. <laughs> there are the nails sticking out of his knees. <laughs> oh my god. Dude, what is up with this one? Dude, Popeye. What? <laughs> dude, you better watch out, man. Popeye, he, he ain't eating that spinach anymore. He's getting them roids, <laughs> man. Like, he's, he's a little too buff. He's like a liver king. He's the liver king of the seas. But anyways, we got to stop that because we got to... We got we got a time we got to keep track of, man. <laughs> but anyways, there we have it. <laughs> there we have it. His comments are wild, man. Oh my lord. Oh my goodness. 
<laughs> We're going to be moving on from the Southern Front up to Kiev. The government's speech for President Volodymyr Zelensky. And so, without further ado, here's the speech. Enjoy. It's not a long one either. It's only 2 minutes and 38 seconds. So, let me make sure it's not in English. It's in Ukrainian. All right. And no, 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 no. No, we don't. We, we want the subtitles to be in English. Okay, so apparently there's no second track. Ukrainci <laughs> Подумки був із тими своїми близькими, рідними та друзями, хто зараз воює, хто зараз щодня, щогодини ризкує своїм життям заради України. Кожен такий день – це нагадування для усього нашого народу, для кожного, хто працює на державу. Нагадування, чим заповнене все, що є нашою державою. Українські родини, чиї сини та доньки загинули в боях для них – для батьків українських героїв синьо-жовтий прапор України це тепер нагадування про рідну дитину, про її подвиг заради держави, дитина, чий батько загинув на фронті, захищаючи Україну. Кохані, яким більше не зустрітися, бо війна забрала життя, яке стало життям України, все, що є нашою державою і всі, хто є нашою державою, кожна інституція, кожен посадовець повинні відчувати, яка Україна за ними. Скільки болю в її серці, скільки відваги у неї, яка пам'ять про людей, яких більше немає. Що тепер в її символах та як по-іншому люди сприймають тепер все, що принижує Україну, її сила та сподівання. Бути достойними шляхом, яким йде Україна, це обов'язок давати Україні більше сили, більше можливостей. Обов'язок бути небайдужими до кожного, кожної, хто поруч із тобою. Підтримувати, дбати про людей, завжди наближати результат. Головний результат для України – Україна має перемогти. Для всіх це головне, щоб не відводити очей від поглядів на фотографіях воїнів, на стіні пам'яті, на інших меморіалах. Я дякую всім, хто працює заради України, хто б'ється заради України саме, саме так. Достойно, сміливо, міцно. Слава усім нашим воїнам, слава нашому народу, народу. Україна. Вічна пам'ять усім, хто віддав своє життя заради України. Слава Україні! And the Rome Slava! And with that, that is the end of President Zelensky's speech, and that is also the end of the halftime show. We are starting the second part of this stream. We'll be addressing a poll. Uh, we only ran one poll. Um, we're trying uh, also just to key y'all in a little bit um we are starting to find that running this and doing law school is very strenuous on the mind and also on the body <laughs> like i'm not even kidding it is a little tough and so we are trying to make sure to limit uh the length of these streams down to be a little bit shorter we're still going to be running them six days a week but shorter uh so that's why we're only running two polls tonight instead of four like we have been um, but we're going to address that poll, and then we're going to be getting on into the chats, both the Super Chats and the Live Chats. You do not have to pay to have a question answered on this channel. You can throw one in absolutely free, but if you would like to support the channel and help us keep it running, and also get a question answered a little bit quicker than everyone else, you can throw in a Super Chat, because by law on the Enforcer channel, it's, it's a law of our channel pretty much, uh, we have to read off every single Super Chat and every single supporter who's helped the channel to keep on running, unless... If it is the very end of the stream and they ask that we don't, that's the only time we will never read them off. But with that, we are now going to be moving on into that poll. And so with that, what do we got, Matthew? All right. And also, by the way, there are three to address, but we're going to go through them very quickly. And the first one says, Russia says that Wagner is an illegal armed formation and demands that Syria expel them immediately. And what are your thoughts? 44% said Wagner will be fully dismantled. 12% said unsure. 21% said it seems like it's probably over. And 23% said Wagner will eventually do a coup. And I think the writing is on the wall. Wagner will be dismantled. But Enforcer, what say you? I think the Wagner is already dismantled at this point, in my opinion. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And we are on to the next one.
And the next one says, Zelensky says he wants the Israeli model in respect to receiving Western support. And what are your thoughts? 60% said good. It seems like a fair plan to me. 24% said what is the Israeli plan? 11% said unsure. And 6% said bad. It seems like a one-sided plan. And just really quick, in 10 seconds, the Israeli plan is basically where Ukraine receives support, but they don't really get any advice or instruction from the West, and we're basically just giving them stuff without any strings attached to it. Uh, to me, it seems like that's fine. That's kind of what we're doing now, and I would agree with it. So, Enforcer, what say you? I would say I don't really see that much of a problem with it, to be honest. I think that's a pretty okay plan if I've heard one. And so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well, and we are on to the next one. All right, and moving on to our last poll, which actually was a little bit contentious. It says, Zelensky says Ukraine could do elections in 2024, quote-unquote, during wartime, only if allies share the cost. And what are your thoughts? It looks like 29% said that's unreasonable. Another 29% said, eh, it's understandable at least. 24% said unsure. And 18% said that is acceptable. And to me, I'm not even going to mince words about it. That is unreasonable by any standard. Uh, we should not be paying for Ukraine's elections. That is their responsibility. And the fact that they're saying that the issue is mainly the cost and not whether or not they can actually carry it out, um, it seems to me that they should definitely carry, uh, carry out an election in 2024, and they should not hold off because apparently they can do it, and right now it's just a matter of cost. Um, so I think they can get it done, and they should, uh, to prove that they are not like Russia and to make sure that everyone knows that they are a Western-aligned country. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say um, that military support and economic support, and I would actually kind of have to agree with Matthew on this, is one thing, um, because, of course, the Ukrainians are being supported by the Western world. We have inherent strategic interests there. But I would have to largely agree with Matthew. Putting money towards them running their elections is kind of a little odd. They have been able to run their elections normally. Um, before the war, of course, it is wartime, but at the same time, um, I have a feeling that that seems, it, it seems like it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to be trying to fund their own elections, because if they want us to fund their elections, you know, I, I, it just seems like a weird precedent. Are we going to go around the world now and start funding everyone's elections uh, that, just seems a little odd to me. So I got to be honest with y'all, not really a fan of that. I feel like if the Ukrainians want to run their own elections, that's kind of a little bit of a concern on how they're going to fund that, not how we're going to fund that. Um, because I'm all for supporting Ukraine. All of y'all know that. That's why we run fundraisers. That's why we cover the six days a week. That's why we do all of this. But there is a point where things start to sound a little unreasonable and asking the United States or the Western world to try and foot the bill for their own elections, which they're supposed to be holding anyways, that seems a little odd. Uh, so that would be my take on it. I'm not really a big fan of that idea. I, of course, military support and economic support all day, any day of the week, but funding their election, that is seem that does seem a little bit odd. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And also, y'all are completely free to disagree as well. Some people think that when we say something, it's law. And you're totally fine to disagree. Uh, but the thing is, is that keep it civil, please. Uh, we... We, we do this we do this all the time and one thing that i've known and one thing i've seen is that regardless whether y'all want to threaten us with death or whether you just slightly disagree with us and put it in a polite way you don't change anything with your comment and neither do we we don't change anything either so it's really just talking about it and seeing what folks think so just keep that in mind and keep it civil so if you disagree with us totally fine i can see why y'all disagree i understand um, but put it in a civil way so that way we can have a little bit of a conversation about it instead of throwing knives at each other and so with that I hope that does address that fairly well. And I see some people even saying, and oh, what, 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 what? And real quick, just to provide a little bit of context, we'll see some folks saying that sounds like Russian propaganda. This one is not Russian propaganda. I saw somebody get jumped earlier for saying it. Uh, they were actually correct. Uh, and this was reported by Reuters. Uh, so it is definitely from a legitimate source. Zelensky himself said in an interview that there isn't a problem actually holding the elections themselves. Obviously, it's going to be difficult because it is in the middle of, the, in, uh, in the middle of a war, uh, but they will simply send around these people to collect ballots from people. They do have a process that they can use to get it done. And right now, the, the problem is Zelensky saying that they don't have enough money to get it done, and he's unwilling to bring money from weaponry and put it toward elections. He wants to put everything into weaponry and not a dime into the elections. Uh, so that's where the uh, contention basically arises from is that. Um, and to me, it seems like that's being a little bit obstinate. But Enforcer, what say you? And also another thing, and this was actually a very good thing, very well-observed thing. Let me make sure. 
um, that I could find it again because I want to give them credit for what they said. Um, let's see. Tamerlane, actually, from the live chat, said, It's wartime. Elections after the war makes... Wait, wait hang on. That's not the right, the right one. It's actually uh, Dronum00 who said, There are constitution snobs general elections in a war, period. Full stop. Uh, and I thank you for writing, apparently, in Morse code. I'll try and throw that in a Morse code translator, translator here in a minute since you put period and full stop. That's how you end the message in Morse. But uh, to address that, you are right. The Constitution of Ukraine actually forbids them from even running an election during wartime. It's written into their Constitution. So it does seem kind of weird that, you know, an election is possible if, you know, if we try and, and like pay or something. And, I, and some people are saying, oh, no, we're not paying for their elections. We're just paying for securities. But then what you're saying is we have to pay money up front for the election to even happen, whether it be securities or directly paying for it or not. So that largely means we're funding the election and its existence at all in 2024. Uh, and to be quite honest, I don't like the idea of that. I mean, like, hell, Ukraine has multiple options if they wanted to run an election to have one. Uh, you could do entirely mail-in ballots. You could find out a way to do that, or you could do it online. Although there's a lot of questions about whether that would even be a, a good way to vote or not, considering that a online internet voting system would probably be the most insecure. You could, of course, do in-person polling stations, but it's feared that those would become targets for Russian attacks, and in all honesty, they probably would, so that wouldn't be a smart idea either. Uh, but they do have several options out there, and you know, if they want to hold an election, they might have to assess that there will be inherent risks in running an election or find a way to do it where there is no inherent risk for it. But anyways, with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And some of y'all are even getting into arguments, not about that um, poll right there. Some of y'all are even getting into discussions and arguments, not really arguments, but more so discussions, about whether they should even have an election in the war at all. And that seems to be more so of the crux of the issue for most of y'all than the poll itself. So... Very interesting stuff we're seeing. Well, you, gonna, well, well? You, you know, you you are correct uh, that they're under martial law right now. And technically, according to the Ukrainian law, they aren't supposed to hold an election under these conditions. But the catch is the reason why Zelensky made those comments is because a politician, which we will not name, uh, was asking Zelensky some questions about the elections on his visit over there. And basically, uh, the allude, or they alluded to basically a loss of support to Ukraine if an election wasn't held in 2024. And that's why Zelensky suddenly changed his mind on it and decided to start sort of taking a more less hardcore approach to saying that they're absolutely opposed to holding an election. But then he made the uh, issue about money. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, and so with that, I hope we address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and with that, we are fresh out of poll questions, so we are moving on to our Super Chat questions once again. And up first, we have a $20 donation from Robert Nicholson, and please excuse that voice crack, and <laughs> thank you very much, Robert, for that support, and there's no comment to address, but Enforcer, what say you? I gotta thank you so much for the support, Robert Nicholson, absolute legend. I love your Labrador profile picture, by the way, absolutely love it. And I gotta thank you so much for the support, of course, being a Leaf Spring Army viewer from Canada, you didn't throw in a comment, but the support does mean a lot and helps us to keep this thing rolling. And I thank everyone who does support the channel, because if you do, you help us to keep this thing rolling. We're greatly appreciative, and we even give you a shout-out on stream to show you how appreciative we are, and also let everyone know who are the folks who are supporting this channel to make it possible. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right. And Minnesota! <laughs> <laughs> Man, smacking them down left and right. Come on, bots. Get some. But anyways, moving on to our next Super Chat, we have a $20 donation from Larry Weidener. And thank you very much, Larry, for that support. And he says, Slavia Ukraine. And do you think Ukraine can keep up drone attacks like this every day or once a week? Either way, it's great to see. And from Portage, Indiana. Hey! And well, they gave us an exact place. Portage, Indiana. We've found it. Portage. Where is this? So this is that tiny slither of coastline that Indiana has, like right near Chicago. It's right on the very edge of Chicago, um, or like the Chicago metropolitan area. But let's drop down there, Matthew. Let's see what this place looks like. Because this looks like downtown Portage to me. Does it look like Portage? Or does it look like Portage? I like the pavers. The road. Oh, there's the road snakes. Road snakes. Get back. <laughs> but anyways, um, 
it's not that bad. It looks kind of like, honestly, it looks like uh, towns in Alabama. I mean, it looks very similar to what Alabama looks like, really. Pretty like, close. Like Silicauga. It, it, it gives me Silicauga feels. Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always waiting for Matthew to input. It's like, oh no, is he going to? Um, But still, thank you so much for the support. And I hope that you do enjoy seeing your town on stream. And to answer that question, I don't really think it's going to be happening at a daily or even a weekly pace. It appears to be happening every uh, well, bi-weekly or once a month at this point that these major attacks are occurring. So I think we're going to see them at less, uh, less frequent intervals. But nevertheless, they are going to be occurring somewhat regularly at this point. And so with that, I thank you so much once again for the support. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next one goes to Susan Lowell, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much, Susan, as well for the support. And she says, in honor of the brave and clever Ukrainian soldiers. And I got to tell you, the Ukrainian soldiers are incredibly brave. And not only that, they're very clever and, and very intelligent as well on the battlefield. And they certainly deserve a lot of praise and a lot of respect from uh, armed forces and just folks in general from around the world because they've been doing an amazing job in Ukraine ever since day one. Uh, you couldn't ask you couldn't ask for more um, from the Ukrainian soldiers than what they're doing, and they've been doing the impossible every single day. And so with that, thank you so much for the support, Susan Lowell. I hope that does address that fairly well, and thank you so much once again for supporting this channel. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Cindy Mitchell, who puts in a twenty dollar donation as well. Thank you very much, Cindy, very much for that support. And she says from Nana and Private Tucker. Hey, and welcome back, Cindy Mitchell. It's been a minute, and it's good to have you back. Thank you so much for the support, and hello to you and Tucker, um, and thank you all to both of you all for being here tonight, and of course being members of the Lee Spring Army, and supporting the channel, and helping us to keep this thing going. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And we have a 20 from Troy Wilson, who says, Great show, guys, and long live the LSA and Slav Ukraine. And thank you so much for the kind words, Troy Wilson. We can always count on you to be one of the biggest supporters of the Lee Spring Army. And I got to thank you so much once again for enjoying the channel and also throwing in Super Chats and support to help it to keep rolling. I can't say it enough. The Super Chats are the only thing that keep us rolling. And I got to thank everyone who goes out of their way and understands that we do this as a job and support us to keep this thing alive. And so thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Butchie777, who puts in a 20 and says, Have you seen voodoo orcs made by a Ukrainian soldier's wife to raise funds for the armed forces? They can give one out free if you're in the military. Got to love the Ukrainian sense of humor and slow Ukraine. And slow Ukraine. And thank you so much for the support. I actually have not seen the little Russian voodoo dolls. Uh, but to be quite honest with you, I'll, I'll just say this. I rarely ever air my personal opinion on stream, but voodoo dolls to me are bad juju. I don't, I don't mess with them. So, uh, like, uh, like they're neat, but me personally, I would never have one. I, I would be kind of, I'd honestly kind of be scared of that thing. Um, you know, and everyone's gonna be like, what? That's irrational. Uh, well, mm, mm. <laughs> you ever been to, you ever been to Louisiana? If you go there, you'll have a different opinion on it. But anyways, Thank you so much for the support. I hope that does address that fairly well. And pretty interesting to hear. And so with that, we are on to the next one. Thank you so much once again for the support. All right. And up next, we have another first-time Super Chatter. We have Aaron Shu. And I hope I say your hey! last name properly. Um, Aaron, uh, I believe, is new to the channel as well tonight. We've got a lot of new viewers tonight. And thank you very much, Aaron, for that very generous $50 donation. And like we said before, helping to keep the entire operation rolling. He says, a long-time viewer, but first Super Jet, and he has been around for a while. He's been lurking, apparently. Hey. He says, anyhow, in regards to a possible Ukraine invasion into Russia, would it be a ban on Western weapons and or Western-made ammo from crossing the border? And I thank you so much for supporting us for the first time, Aaron. And I thank you for helping the channel to keep running. Um, we are always, you know, and i got to be quite honest, we are always... Uh, wondering if folks will support the channel because it helps us to keep this thing running. It helps us to do it as a job. And I got to thank you so much for supporting us for the first time. And I got to thank you so much for that. And I also got to thank you for watching this channel for an incredibly long time too and, and enjoying it a great deal. Uh, to answer your question, uh, let's see. 
In regards to a possible Ukraine invasion into Russia, would it be a ban on Western weapons or Western-made ammo from crossing the border? Um, there would be a ban on Western weapons being used in Ukraine. There's already a ban in place like that for every weapon system we've given them. And if the Ukrainians started to use those against the Russians and inside of Russia, if they were to invade the Russian mainland, we would probably stop giving them weapons altogether because that would be crossing a line that we wouldn't be comfortable with and it, it strategically it makes sense because we've been trying to avoid an open conflict with the russians we still are on a strategic level and also a diplomacy level and so it wouldn't make a lot of sense to then let the ukrainians drag the united states and the western world into war with russia because we've been avoiding it for this long um so with that I hope that does address that fairly well, Aaron, because that was that's most likely the way it would go. So hopefully the Ukrainians don't do anything like that, because that would probably end up taking Ukrainian sport south. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that fairly well, and thank you for being a longtime viewer of the Leaf Spring Army. I don't know if you're an old guard or uh, if you've uh, been around as a soldat, but I thank you so much once again for the support, and thank you for being a member of this Leaf Spring Army. And so with that, thank you so much once again, and we are on to the next one. And up next, shout out to Historic Tasman for putting in a 15 without a comment. And thank you very much, Historic Tasman, for being a longtime viewer yourself and also helping support the channel. We also have a 20 from Dilly Dillinger, who says LSA and love from Rizor. Dilly Dilly, and hey, he put in where he is again. And really quickly, I got to go to Rizor in Norway. We can't put that little cool letter. Where is this again? It was right there. Dude, we passed over this. Uh, uh, Dilly Dillinger. Just in case y'all are wondering, threw in a super chat on Saturday, and he said, love from Norway. And then I was around here. I was in between Christiansand and Oslo, and I was like, he's somewhere in here. And I never saw it. It was here. It's a beautiful place, by the way. Y'all ought to check it out when y'all get the chance. But thank you so much, Dilly Dillinger, for being one of our Lee Spring Army viewers all the way from Norway, one of the most beautiful countries in, in Northern Europe. And I thank you so much once again for being a supporter of this channel as well and helping us to keep this thing rolling. And thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to Junebug72, who puts in a 14 and says, Good evening. Go Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Here I'm Slava. Thanks for reporting. Hey, and thank you so much for the support, Junebug. And thank you so much uh, for enjoying our reporting and supporting us so that way you can keep it going. Um, this channel is very special in its premise. Uh, it only runs off of Super Chats. Um, well, that, that has kind of changed a little bit recently with the videos very in a very minor way. Uh, but nevertheless... Y'all have made this channel possible, and y'all are the bread and butter that allows us to do this as a job. And so thank you so much for supporting us, so that way we can keep up this reporting that you and a whole bunch of folks always are telling us that y'all enjoy. Y'all make it possible for us to be here, so that way everyone can continue to enjoy the channel. And so thank you so much, and good evening to you, and Slava Ukraini, and Horom Slava, and thank you so much once again for the support. And so with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and we have a 10 from Jay Bagwell, also a longtime channel legend. Hey! And it's good to see you once again, Jay. And he says the U.S. government has developed a four-missile Tomahawk launcher for the new Joint Light Tactical Vehicle built exclusively for the Marines to shut down shipping lanes. And the Army said, I want one too. <laughs> Dude, the, the Marines sat there and said, finally, we have enough money to go into research and development. And then the Army said, ooh, dibs. <laughs> and they just took the whatever they made. <laughs> but, and then the Marines are like, Damn it! You know, we just finally got a budget, and now everyone's ripping us off. But um, thank you for sharing that with us, Jay Bagwell. And also, thank you for being the one of the coolest viewers we have. And also, thank you very much for the little uh, ammunition crates. And thank you so much for that little 20-round M16 mag that you got me, because that thing looks so freaking good. Thank you so much for that. That was so cool. And also the sling. Um, and everything else. And also taking us to range. That was really cool. Um, but still... Indeed. Thank you so much for everything, Jay, and also sharing that little cool fun fact with us tonight, because you know the Marines are probably like, what the hell? Why did we spend the money on the development when the Army's just going to take it and use it as well? Uh, but with that, thank you so much once again for support. I hope that does address that. And with that, we are on to the next one. And this one goes to Stephen Richards, who puts in a $10 donation and says, what air defense doing? And man, what is it doing? Nothing. Man, you said it. <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much for the support. And what is air defense doing in Russia? 
nothing apparently they could shoot down Prigozhin like like they're freaking dead eye but then when it comes around to ukrainian drone attacks nowhere to be found and that's why i think that Prigozhin's jet being shot down is deliberate thank you for listening to my ted talk but with that thank you so much once again for support hope that does address that fairly well and with that we are on to the next one and we have a ten dollar super chat from lord alathorn who says hey from kodiak question mark I guess so. If that's where you're from, I guess hey from Kodiak. He said, there are 100 leopards in Italy being halted by the Swiss, destined for Ukraine, and do you think they will be allowed to continue on to Ukraine? And hello to Kodiak in Alaska. There's Kodiak right there. I guess that's where the Kodiak cameras come from. And also, they got noodles. Uh, but moving on from that, <laughs> moving on from that, right. uh, in that little joke right there, um, interesting to hear that, because I didn't hear that Italian leopards were held up by the Swiss. Uh, and I'll have to try and look into that into a little bit more detail and find out why that's the case. Uh, because the Swiss, from what I understand, don't produce the leopards. It's Krauss Maffei Wegman, uh, which is a German company that produces them. So I don't know right off the top of my head how the Swiss could hold that up. But I will read into it more and see if that is the case and why. Um, but thank you for sharing with the, that for us right now. Thank you so much once again for the support. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Scott Haskins, who puts in a $10 donation as well, and says, Still can't compute why Prigozhin didn't just stay put and occupy Rostov, and the possibilities are endless with the amount of leverage he could have had, and doubt Putin would siege with war going on, and thoughts. You and know, it comes down to as simple as this. Uh, they had his family, so he had to get, he had to get out. But Enforcer, what say you? You know, there were, there was an endless ways that that coup could have ended, uh, and and every single one of them would have ended up being successful, except for the one path that was taken. Uh, I don't know why he took that path. I don't know why he gave up two hours away from Moscow. We'll never know his the family. Answer. Well, yeah, but we'll never really know the true answers to those questions. We think it was his family, but who really knows? I mean, hell, they could have sat there and said, we're going to release your sexy photos. And he went, no, nothing but that. <laughs> like, you already put out the camouflage thing. Nothing but that. Uh, you know, it could have been anything. So who knows? But um, yeah, I, I don't know why it ended like that. I can't, I can't even give you thoughts on that because there were so many different ways it could have gone. And it went the worst way it could have ever possibly occurred. So with that... Thank you so much once again for the support. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And we have a $10 super chat from Wilderness LSASA, who says, Once there was a time when Russia deported uh, from Baltics 100,000 intelligence to die in camps. Now their intelligence is hiding there. Sec agent re reporting in and out. And Bamuba, what, what, what happened, LSA? And thank you so much for the support and sharing that little bit of info with us. And you're absolutely right. The Russians ended up usually treating everyone that was under their uh, their control quite poorly. Uh, the Georgians were treated poorly, except for Stalin. Uh, Stalin was actually a Georgian. Y'all might not know that. Uh, and that's so funny that in World War II, Matthew, the leaders of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were neither from Russia nor Germany. Hitler was from Austria and Stalin was from Georgia. It's like, how in the hell did that? Anyways, we're, we're not going down that rabbit hole because we have a clock <laughs> and, and, and it's ticking quickly uh but anyways to answer that that is quite true a decent amount of of the people who were deported by the soviets uh during the past century for the most part have ended up returning to where they were and they brought the hatred of the soviet union and the russians with them back to where they've come uh and so with that thank you so much once again for support i hope that does address that fairly well and with that we are on to the next one and the next one goes to Putin will hang in the middle of the Kremlin, who puts in a $6 donation and says, question from the chat, please. And we will grab that question from the chat, from the chat, excuse me. We also have a five from CK Bold who said the same thing, so we'll grab two of them. Uh, and thank you both for the support. The first one is from Kat, who says, how would you take Crimea? Um, well, I would take Crimea, uh, most likely by a double-pronged attack heading from the direction of Tokmak and also in Harrison. This one would probably be the one that does most of the heavy lifting, um, so create some bridgeheads across the river, shoot them down towards Armyansk. The Russians would probably start freaking out at that point, and their armies would start racing backwards from Tokmak towards that area, and then this Ukrainian army in the area around Rykiv and Vasilivka just races down the highway right behind the Russians and ends up cornering them down here. Uh, then you could destroy the bridge across the Chanhar Gap in this area, considering that it's a choke point. I wouldn't fight through it. I would just blow this thing to Kingdom Common, not let the Russians cross. And then you got an entire Russian army group stuck up here in the Harrison Oblast with no supplies coming across the land bridge because that was cut off behind them. And they're also trying to push the Ukrainians out of Armyansk, and now they have a strong foothold there. And not only that, they actually have the 
truly only land connection that goes into Crimea that's big enough that it's not a bottleneck like Chanhar is. That's how I would go about it in the simplest uh, terms, but that's in a perfect situation where everything went my way and military planning is great to have like that, but usually nothing goes the way it's supposed to, and then you got to come up with a plan on the fly while trying to keep with the general guidelines. But that's how I would do it. Uh, and so with that, thank you so much for sponsoring that live chat. That was a really good one. And with that, we are on to the next one. And up next, we have a question from Margaret Hemsley, who says, why is USA asking the Ukrainian arm, uh, army to slow down the use of its drones? Uh, I actually have not heard that. Have you, Matthew? Uh... I've heard them say slow down the use of their drones on Russian territory because the West doesn't want them attacking inside of mainland Russia, but I haven't heard them complain about using drones on the Russians inside of Ukraine. Yeah, I haven't heard that either. So unfortunately, I'd largely have to declare ignorance on that one because uh, I haven't heard about the claims to be able to make a statement on them, sadly. But I do thank you for the support, and I hate that we can't address that question, but I hope you do understand. Uh, and with that, thank you so much once again, and we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Dean London, who puts in a five and says, These updates really drill home the need to support the Ukrainians. I do at home in the UK, and I hope this helps a bit. And thank you so much for supporting the channel, because uh, while we aren't Ukraine, supporting the channel helps us out a great deal and helps us to keep this thing rolling. Um, of course, I, I always have to say this every once in a while. We've, we've said this a little bit recently. There's someone out there who makes it sound like it's a crime that we do this as a job, and, and you know, of course, we have to support ourselves to be able to do this uh but i've got to thank everyone who does support the channel the blithering idiot yeah and doesn't listen to that crap because what's also stupid is that that guy makes about eight thousand dollars a month uh off of this so he's making about 90 something thousand dollars a year and you can see that that's true when you ask him for his 1099 which by the way he's been harassing us to release our fun uh our financial reports and information but then when you ask for his he goes off the handle uh so thank you all for supporting us regardless of what folks folks are saying out there that is absolutely untrue and completely hypocritical and uh thank you also for supporting ukraine as well not to always jump back to that but that's something that is always going on in the background um and something we've tried to quell so many times and yet every time we've tried it has just completely failed not to our control outside of our control uh but i hope that does address that fairly well and thank you for supporting us and supporting ukraine as well most importantly ukraine uh and so with that Thank you so much once again, and we are on to the next one. He's a transparent man, I tell you, a transparent man. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm so transparent. But anyways, moving on to our next super chat, we have a $5 donation from Opus, who says, smack the like, LSA. And thank you so much for the support. Uh, and also, do smack the like. We're up to 2,400 likes. So if you want to smack that like a little bit more, by all means, please do. And so with that, thank you so much once again for the support, and I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Mark Gagné, uh, who does not leave a comment. But thank you very much, Mark, for that support. And we do appreciate it very much. And moving on to our next one, we have a five from Herp Derp NV, uh, who says, Can we get an impression of Orange Man announcing that CIA has outed Kermit the Frog as a communist infiltrator that will be sent to Gitmo? I've got to tell you something. We're back in business. I'm going to give you a little bit of a press brief because while we got a lot going on with China, we also got a lot going on with people like Suleimani. Suleimani, great guy. I mean, terrible guy, terrible guy. He was terrible. We bombed oh, the shit out of him. Baghdadi. We bombed the shit out of him at the Iraqi airport in Baghdad. He was crying like a bitch. He saw the missile coming. But anyways, moving on to Kermit. Kermit the Frog. Jack Mullet, or whatever the hell his name was, the puppeteer guy. Uh, we, we got Kermit. Kermit was crying. He was sniveling like a little bastard. We, we put him in prison. We're going to be sending him to Guantanamo Bay. We're going to have him tortured. A little bit of waterboarding. He's going to be, he's going to be spilling all the beans about the piggies. All the piggies. I'm telling you, I, I don't know a lot about piggies. I just know about Rosie O'Donnell, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, I thank you so much once again for the support. I hope you appreciated this fairly well, because it takes a lot of strain on my voice to do this one, because I made it so gravelly, and I've never been able to fix the voice after I did that, but thank you so much once again. It's absolutely great. And we're going to get that little green bastard. Like Michael Michael said, we're going to get the little green bastard. We're going to do him. Oh, we're going to get him good. Great, great. It's going to be absolutely huge, but still, thank you so much. They said, said, they said that Kermit's going to have enhanced interrogation, meaning the water is going to be extra. You have to pay extra for extra water. 
<laughs> I'm telling you, we're gonna be we're gonna be waterboarding them with uh, orange man water, or it's the greatest water. It's, it's absolutely orange wonderful. juice. Cleanses the Tropicana. nostrils. Tropicana. When you drop it in your and when you drop it in your nose, it cleanses the nostrils. It's absolutely great. And then we'll give them a steak to to, to smooth everything over. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be absolutely wonderful. I, I gotta tell you, I gotta really work on that voice. It's gotten so out of form uh, recently. But anyways. Thank you so much for the support. I hope that was what you were looking for. And with that, we are on to the next one. And thank you once again. Also, really quickly, um, saw someone say, don't do that impression. We do impressions of everyone. Um, you know, I do uh, I do the current sitting president, the former one. Uh, I do the top 1% of this country owns half of this country's wealth. I do them all. Um, so, you know, it's nothing in particular crapping on one or praising oh. one. Uh, Lag. Oh no! Oh God! Oh! oh, we're back. Oh, good. Okay, okay. Thank the Lord. It, it's nothing about one particular one or the other. It's just humor, and uh, I'm not really into the idea of shutting down humor because some people might find it offensive or not. You know, it's, it, it just is what it is. But, anyways, with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to Suzanne B, who puts in a five dollar donation and says, "I understand how helicopters try to avoid missiles aimed at them, but how do jets avoid a targeted missile?" Uh, jets avoid a targeted missile. There's actually several ways that jets can avoid targeted missiles. Uh, there is chaff and flares. Uh, chaff is uh, more so to deflect radar signatures. They're little metal shards that they shoot out of the aircraft, and the cloud of them actually creates a radar signature, and the hope is that a radar-guided missile will actually pick up onto the metal shard cloud instead of the jet. Uh, and that only works for radar-guided missiles. Uh, flares work for heat-seeking missiles, so things like AIM-9 Sidewinders or the Russian equivalent, which is an R-73 Archer. Uh, those have very, very hot heat signatures, or at least some of them do. And, it, you know, when you really get into the nerding out of things, uh, flares are also made specifically. Sometimes they're actually colder than the jet engines burn because it's a whole story. But anyways, they emit heat, flares do, and those are meant to uh, make a heat-seeking missile pick up on that flare instead of the plane. Another thing that aircraft do, especially with radar-guided missiles, uh, is that they crank. And cranking is when a plane, when it's 70 miles away and the missile's coming at them, they take a right turn, and then they take a left turn after a little bit, and then they take a right turn. And what that's doing is that the missile, while it's flying, is it's constantly adjusting itself and trying to lead that jet. So it's having to turn a lot harder than the jet is in that turn. And so while it's on its way towards the jet and it's making these turns, it's bleeding speed. So that way, by the time it gets to the jet, it's a lot slower than it would have been. And hopefully, by that point, the jet can pull a pretty hard maneuver and the missile just overshoots uh, and misses the jet entirely. But those are some of the ways that a jet can end up evading a missile. Really, the only thing helicopters have going for them is chaff and flares, and also some of them have a uh, some kind of a jamming device built onto them, but those are fairly expensive and somewhat rare, especially for transport aircraft like MI-8s, MI-17s, or Blackhawks. Uh, those usually don't have them, but your attack helicopters like the AH-64, they usually have them built on. And some KA-52s also have that as well. And so with that, I thank you so much for the support. I hope that does uh, address that fairly well and also plexus gaming said the maneuver is called jinking i've always heard it was cranking um but i might be wrong with that but anyways with that thank you so much for the support hope that does address that fairly well and with that we are on to the next one all right and moving on to the next one we have a 20 dollars donation from daniel lee and thank you very much daniel for that support he says enforcers i have patches for you guys and i tweeted on twitter with the picture of them and, and man we gotta peep the x and see uh see those patches man and man he burned my patch. <laughs> you know what I mean, man? Like the, the kid who got uh, fried at the airsoft range on full auto. And they said, dude, right. what the heck? And he said, he burned my patch. And he like he calls this kid like emotional damage and physical harm because he burned his patch. But anyways, moving on from that, we will check out the patches. And we would love to have them. I mean, hell, I, I would like to have a patch. Wouldn't you like to have a patch, Matthew? I'd like to have one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so with that. Thank you so much for the support, Daniel Lee. We will check them out after the stream. And thank you so much once again for helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to the B93 who puts in a five. It says, for the spinach fund, Uniform History has a whole episode on why both French and Russians and other countries like blue stripes shirts. It's history fashion. 
And thank you for the support. I, I know it's history fashion, but I still think it looks goofy, especially in the modern world. <laughs> the Ukrainians even do that. They got rid of that thing. They had the striped shirt uh, for a good bit of their modern history. Uh, but I thank you so much for the support. I will check out that video, though, because I love watching history videos, even if it's on stuff I've heard about already, because maybe it's saying something new. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again for support, helping this channel to keep on running, and sharing that little fact with us. And so with that, we are on to the next one. Thank you once again. And the next one goes to inconsistent user data, who puts in a, <laughs> excuse me, who puts in a five and says, ring, ring, SCPUA, breach confinement. Uh, please calmly get to the closest safe zone. Question from chat, question mark. Sure, sure, we'll get you one. Um, we'll get you one for sure. I don't know why I was acting like that was a revelation for a minute. But <laughs> <laughs> anyways, the question from the chat goes to Renee. He says, is it true that Ukraine has now made their own long distance missile? Uh, yes, Ukraine has the Hroms and the Grims. Uh, well, actually, the Hrims and the Groms. I got that wrong. I'm kind of dyslexic. But uh, Hroms and Grims, they have those. They're both really the same thing as mostly a modified Iskander. Um, so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And thank you so much once again for sponsoring that live chat. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to Robert Lemieux, who puts in a $1 donation and says, Close the corridor between Krasnodar and Belarus. And the... Yeah. Krasnodar, Blit. Where the hell? What the hell? I forget what Krasnodar is, Blit. Krasnodar, Russia. Oh, yes. I would say close it. In between Krasnodar to Belarus. Yeah, that's the entire Ukrainian border. Hell yeah, why not? And so with that, thank you so much for the support. I don't know why I forgot where Krasnodar was, because I'd know that at any other given time. But thank you once again, and we are on to the next one. And moving on to our live chat questions, we have the Morse code decoders of the stream. Tonight we had Tight Lines LSO, Cliff Simonson, Mark Hodges, Earl Bornu, and Paul Schultz. They said Russian aircraft are lost on the ground more than in the air. Slava LSA and Slava Ukraine. And Slava Ukraine. And that's the sound of money and you got that Morse code message correct. And I gotta thank you for doing that once again tonight because that was the exact message. That was the right one. Right until I said, no, that's not it. And uh, well, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Uh, but anyways, with that, we're going to be moving on from the Morse code message. And sadly, due to time constraints tonight, we're only going to be answering three live chat questions. I'm, Of course, we always want to make sure to answer live chats because it's free to watch this channel. It's free to ask questions. It's up to you whether you want to support, it, uh, support the channel or not and by how much. Uh, but at the same time, we got to make sure to be able to get up tomorrow because we both have to get up at 5.30 in the morning, uh, which means that we'll probably only be getting about four hours of sleep. And so with that, we are on to the third to last question of the night. This one goes to Bobo Yuzala, who says, if you were Major General Budinov, what psyops would you want to use against the orcs? Uh, I would probably use the... Uh, oh, man, damn, that's a that's an in-depth question. You can make an essay on that one. Um I would most put you know, that food out in front of them. Like, you know, put that like mutton on the stick and like wave it around. That's good enough. You know what psyop I do on them? Snipers. <laughs> it it, it does, wrecks the, wrecks the mind when you, when you constantly got to be that's keeping a real op. around. Yeah. That's a, that's not a psyop. That's a real one. You see, because it's, it's all in your head until the bullets passing through it. It's, it's in your head as well, but it's more physical than everything else. But that, that would be my answer to this question for now. So that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And we are on to the second to last question of the night. This one goes to AF Kaplan, who says, Regarding Wagner, do you believe they will try to maintain and solidify their holdings on the African continent? It appears that they're actually having a very hard time doing that right now. With almost no financial backing and the organization of the Wagner falling apart, it seems as though they're probably not going to be able to keep a hold of any of their African uh, possessions. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well from AF Kaplan, an absolute channel legend and an old guard. And with that, we are on to the final question of the night. And so, who was the lucky last person who threw in the lucky last question of the night? And that viewer is Rider's Eye, who says, Are you aware of the Ukrainians finding Chinese-made mortars, and what are the implications? We have heard about them finding Chinese mortar shells, but we haven't heard about Chinese mortars. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, the ammunition... Isn't that big of a deal? It doesn't appear to be showing up in mass. So, you know, who's to say that they didn't buy it from the Iranians because the Iranians also have bought Chinese ammunition at some point. They may be reselling that to the Russians. That might be the case. Uh, so I don't really think it's that major of a deal right now. I think it would be a serious ordeal if we started to see Chinese rifles uh, and Chinese heavy artillery pieces arriving. Then I would say that's a, certainly a major deal. But right now, that isn't that major of a deal to really escalate anything about or react to yet, at least in my opinion. Uh, and so with that, 
I hope that does address that fairly well, and we have reached the end of tonight's stream. I gotta thank each and every one of y'all so much once again for watching. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to be able to run the news for each and every single one of y'all tonight. Of course, I can't imagine not running the stream. And so, thank y'all all so much once again. We've been greatly honored by all of y'all, around the 8.5 thousand of y'all that were on tonight at the peak. And if y'all did enjoy, please make sure to subscribe, like, and comment because y'all help this channel to keep on rolling and keep on rocking. If it wasn't for y'all, the Lee Spring Army wouldn't be what it is. It wouldn't even exist. And I've got to thank every single one of y'all so much once again for helping this thing to keep on rolling. And so with that, good night, good luck, take care, stay safe, Slavo Ukraini, and long live the Lee Spring Army, and we will get some sleep with uh, Neil Wizenot right now. And with that, Slavo Ukraini. And good night, LSA. See you all tomorrow. Slavo Ukraine. Here I'm Slavo and Slavo LSA. Yes. The Leaf Spring Army sends its regards. Редактор субтитров